Chapter 81, Returns and Patronus vs. Dementors. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at patreon.com fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. Quinn entered the Great Hall, where the students were being directed by the prefects, head boy and girl, and the professors. The Great Hall emptied out its four long house tables, and the entire student population gathered inside it. Looking at the hordes of students, Quinn made his way towards the students clad in blue. Towards the gathering of the Ravenclaw house, Quinn walked at a slow pace. All the sprinting, climbing, and jumping he did at Hogsmeade had left him physically exhausted. Just a second before Quinn reached the Ravenclaw gathering, a blonde blur slammed into him and wrapped its slim arms around his waist. Oof! Quinn stumbled to his back feet, and when he looked down, he saw his dainty little employee, Junior, and friend, Luna Lovegood. Don't worry, I'm 100% fine, Quinn smiled and gently patted Luna's hair in an effort to comfort her. I actually had a fun time, had a delicious beverage. I even bought one for you, you know. Luna stayed like that for a moment before separating from Quinn. She wasn't done as she eyed his body to audit if there were any injuries. Her eyes caught a torn patch on his right arm, and she immediately shifted to Quinn's right and carefully used her hands to look under Quinn's torn sleeve at his skin and saw a shallow cut. Quinn sighed when Luna examined him. Okay, I'm 99% fine. This was caused by random rubble from a building struck by an explosion spell. He took out his fake wand and cast a healing spell to heal the cut on his arm. He fixed his clothes after his healing results satisfied Luna. Quinn looked up from Luna and saw Eddie and Marcus standing a few steps away from him. Nice haircuts. You guys look good. Quinn gave them a lopsided smile. He was happy to see both of them safe. He didn't go and check them because, first, they were in the opposite direction to Novellus Axionite's travel direction, and second, both of his roommates were inside a building, safe from stray spells. Eddie and Marcus wordlessly hugged Quinn, happy to see their friends safe. They were terribly worried and stressed when the two didn't see him in the castle when they arrived. The anxiety crept every minute they waited in the Great Hall, peeking at the entrance to see if Quinn was there or not. Quinn closed his eyes as he hugged his roommates. The tiredness was setting in. The adrenaline previously coursing in Quinn's body during his sneak attacks at the Axionites was now taking its toll, making him feel exhausted. Let's make that girlfriend packed, all right? chuckled Quinn as he said the words while hugging them, eliciting laughs from the two boys. After separating from the hug, Quinn made walked around the Great Hall, checking on his friends, regular customers, friendly acquaintances, and AID-related acquaintances. Starting with Ravenclaw, Quinn greeted everybody he knew in his own house. He checked on some of his juniors and peers who had come to him when they had a doubt. He went to see Katie Bell at the Gryffindor table and checked on her. Quinn greeted the Weasley twins and swept a lazy eye over the Golden Squad. At the Hufflepuff gathering, Quinn said hello to Cedric Diggory, who he sometimes chatted. He also talked to his frequent Hufflepuff customers. He made small talk before finally moving to the Slytherin table. At Slytherin, he directly went to Daphne and Tracy and saw the two girls standing with Astoria. Are you two all right? The three Slytherin girls turned to come across Quinn, who was standing there with them. Ye, yeah, we are fine, Tracy spoke, still shocked at what happened at Hogsmeade. Where were you guys during the attack? Quinn asked as he observed the girls, looking if there were any signs of injury. We were inside the three broomsticks, answered Daphne, who was, similarly, observing Quinn. Quinn sighed in relief and nodded. Then you were in one of the safest places in Hogsmeade. Astoria tilted her head and questioned Quinn. A pub is the safest place at Hogsmeade? What makes you say that? Quinn chuckled and tossed a chocolate cube towards Astoria, who caught it and wondered, how did Quinn suddenly make chocolate appear in his hand? The pub is usually filled with adults, so there surely were plenty of wands to protect students, Quinn explained, smiling as he saw Astoria observing the chocolate in her hand and glancing at Quinn's hand. Apart from Madame Rosmerta's three broomsticks, Ebforth Dumbledore's Hogshead Inn would be the safest place in Hogsmeade. Nay, 
Hogshead beats out the more busy three broomsticks. The clientele of the Hogshead is much more interesting than the one of the three broomsticks. The people who visited Hogshead liked to keep their faces covered, and the inn was famous for being shady. If someone hostile entered the place, then they would face a barrage of spells from the clientele who liked to spend their time quietly and without disturbance. Where were you? Were you near those men? Daphne inquired in worry. Quinn laughed and waved his hand to dissuade their worries. Fortunately, and weirdly, I didn't come across a single of those rowdy characters that used to visit Hogsmeade today. Quinn raised one finger and added, I did come near an exploding building wall, so maybe that counts. Daphne's and Tracy's eyes widened as they immediately looked to see if Quinn was injured. Did you get hit? Tracy asked with worry heavy in her voice. Nope, not a single scratch. Quinn rotated on the spot to show them that he had no injuries on his bodies. I bounced the second the wall exploded, right into the opposite direction. He extended his hand forward. Quinn's chill attitude made the girls feel relieved. They put their worries aside and calmed down. How did you toss me this chocolate? Did you have it already in your hand? Astoria was weirdly interested in how Quinn gave her chocolate without taking anything out of his clothes. Quinn chuckled and showed the younger Greengrass his empty hands. Then, he extended her hand behind her ear, and when he pulled his hand back, there was a chocolate cube in hand. Like this, he smiled, wiggling his eyebrows. Astoria took the chocolate from Quinn's hand with a surprised expression and blurted in amazement, Now, how did you do that? My apologies, little lady, but a magician never reveals his secrets. Huh? What do you mean? asked Astoria in confusion. She didn't recognize the famous phrase. Quinn just laughed and didn't reply, which confused Astoria even more. That day, the students were allowed to return to their regular lives after professors did a roll call and made sure that no student was missing. Everybody was relieved to know that no student was missing after the terrorist attack. They learned the full details of the incident the following day when the morning owl raid brought the newspapers to the students and professors. Two people dead, eleven novellus axionites caught by the aurors, and eight of them were found incapacitated when the aurors found them, littered across Hogsmeade. Then there was a section on the mysterious invisible vigilante who aided in stopping the terrorist group before the aurors arrived. The newspapers portrayed a positive image of the invisible vigilante, a hero who helped the public and then vanished without claiming any credit. The Aurors put a message in the newspaper asking for any information about the Invisible Vigilante. They were after this Invisible Vigilante for having used harmful magic in public. Quinn, who read the newspaper, faintly smiled when he saw that the Aurors had no clue regarding his identity. He didn't care about his image in the newspaper. The Invisible Vigilante wouldn't be making an appearance anytime soon. But he did keep clippings from the Quibbler magazine which did a whole article on the Invisible Vigilante's identity. It was an entertaining read with a whole lot of wild theories. Heck, even Luna asked Quinn for his opinion on the future articles on the Invisible Vigilante, since she was a co-writer on the future articles on the Invisible Vigilante. Quinn enthusiastically helped her by suggesting more theories far away from the truth. Good people of Hogwarts, welcome to yet another entertaining game of Hogwarts Quidditch. We are here to watch an exciting game between Gryffindor and Hufflepuff. Quinn sat behind the microphone in the commentator's seat, smiling at the crowded stands with a beaming smile, a smile that didn't match the weather. The noise of storms thundered above in the dark sky. The gray clouds darkened the usually bright sky that appeared in the morning time. By popular demand, I, Quinn West, have returned as the commentator. First of all, I would like to thank you all for the support you people showed to me. Your push to have me as the commentator made me wonder if I should do this for a living. Quinn heard a few chuckles at his back. He turned to see Lily Potter, Phileas Flitwick, and Aurora Sinistra laughing at Quinn's words. Now, I know the weather today is not optimal for you viewers. The visibility might degrade, and it might hinder the viewing experience. But do not worry, I am here with a solution to this very problem. Quinn rubbed his hands as he could feel the scent of money tickle his nose. 
Even though no one could see his face from a distance, he still put on his best sales smile and announced. Brought to you by AID Productions, Rainoscopes, eyewear, vision aids that will help you enjoy the game as clearly as in a well-lit, cloudless day. The revolutionary goggles are fitted with the latest perception-enhancing magic, allowing you to adjust the brightness of your vision. They elevate the experience by increasing visibility no matter what the situation. They are impervious to rain or even hail, and over that, the rainoscopes include zoom capabilities that will allow you to look up super close, like if you were right there in the sky with the players. Mr. West, you aren't allowed to sell products without permission, McGonagall's stern voice traveled throughout the stadium. Everybody heard Quinn chuckle and then him talking to McGonagall, here you go, professor. This one's for you, free of cost. Please, wear it and decide whether this is a gift to the sport of Quidditch or not. There was a brief moment of silence as everybody in the stands carefully listened, waiting for McGonagall's response. Oh, things have gotten clearer. Oh, so this is how you zoom. Oh my, this is impressive. What a handy tool. Quinn immediately turned his face to the microphones and said with enthusiasm, People of Hogwarts, you've heard it. The premier Quidditch nut, Madame McGonagall, the Scottish dame, has approved the Rainoscope. You know it when you hear the praise in her words. The Rainoscope is revolutionary, and unlike the traditional omnioculars, you don't have to keep holding them in your hands, just put them on your eyes and forget they are even there. The light goggles won't be a hindrance in any way, so you'll be able to enjoy your snacks. Even hold hands or hold banners and flags for your teams. Now it was time to open the stores and start selling those babies. Quinn looked over the stands and saw that his salespeople had entered the stands just as he had instructed them to. You can buy the rainoscopes in the stands since as I speak, the hardworking volunteers are roaming the stands for your benefit. And for my benefit, Quinn's thoughts went unheard as he smiled, golden galleons shining in his eyes. Buy the rainoscopes as soon as possible because we only have limited stock. Remember, these kinds of opportunities only come once in a lifetime. And every Quidditch game going forth, Quinn laughed devilishly in his mind. So buy the handy goggles and stand out from your fellow students with a fashionable Quidditch hash accessory. Quinn stood up from his seat as he swept his eyes throughout the stands. He was pleased to see that students were buying his merchandise. Mr. West, please get back to Quidditch, said McGonagall with a sigh, a little embarrassed for losing herself moments ago. Quinn beamed at the deputy headmistress and grinned. Of course, Professor. Turning back to the field, Quinn noted that the players were entering the Quidditch field. At the same time, he looked up at the sky and observed that the storm was getting stronger. Is it possible to even hear me? wondered Quinn. He decided to spruce up magic on the microphone so everyone could hear his voice. Quinn's fingers wrapped around the microphone and pumped magic into the magical microphone. He could feel a faint thrum of magic in it, which brought a smile to his face. The players have entered the field. The game is about to start, so grab onto your rain covers and get ready to see some dangerous flying, especially with all this rain. Oh boy, let's hope people crash. Quinn's voice reached every corner of the stadium and even the players themselves, who couldn't even hear the crowd's cheer. Mr. West, warned McGonagall at his back. So, as I was saying, ahem, ladies and gentlemen, Oliver Wood, Cedric Diggory, and Harry Potter have entered the field, so grab the rainoscopes and zoom on them. Mr. West, anyway, I don't have to tell you what to do. Go crazy, said Quinn very quickly. He finally took a deep breath and roared, let the game begin. As Quinn announced the start of the game, the players took off into the air. Quinn himself turned back and gave a thumbs up to Lily Potter with a goofy smirk since she had yelled to her son. Lily Potter sighed and pinched the bridge of her nose. Appearance-wise, her son, Harry, was a copy of her husband, but on the inside, Harry had plenty of things that reminded her of his godfather, Sirius Black. James had spent his entire school career chasing after her, but Sirius had been famous for being a flirt with any girl that caught his attention. She didn't want her son to copy his godfather's behavior while he was in school. The game continued as the sky got darker and darker. The rain started to pour heavily. 
it was growing harder for the broom riders to maintain a grip on their brooms. The players felt very cold and numb. The rain was leeching any enthusiasm to remain on the field. The visibility got so low that players bumped into each other without knowing if it was a teammate or an opponent. After half an hour under the pouring water, anyone who had rainoscopes saw that Harry Potter had abruptly gone up, his broom climbing up the sky. He rose above the other players, gaining altitude against the pouring rain. Quinn's eyes widened when he recalled the events of this game. Quinn killed the magic in the microphone, turned back towards the teachers, and said, You might want to release your Patronuses towards the sky. Potter is gaining altitude. I'm pretty sure that all the Dementors are just above the stadium. You know with the stands filled with happy people. At once, the teacher's eyes widened. They bolted up from their chairs, looked at each other, whipped out their wands, and shouted at once, Expecto Patronum! Multiple corporeal Patronus shot out from their wands. Silvery guardians climbed up towards the sky. Quinn was about to return his attention back to the sky, but then he heard the groaning of a chair and felt some magic. He turned his face to the other side and saw Albus Dumbledore dressed in dark blue robes, standing up from his chair. In the current weather, his robes looked closer to black than blue. Oh, he is mad. Quinn thought, seeing the darkened face of Albus Dumbledore. The headmaster looked madder than Quinn had ever seen him. There was pure fury etched on his face as he raised the death stick towards and shot his Patronus towards the sky, brighter than every other professor's Patronus. The silver phoenix rose, spread its wings, and flew up towards the hundreds of Dementors closing on Harry Potter. Quinn raised his head and saw the Patronuses dancing around Harry Potter, protecting him from the large horde of Dementors, while Dumbledore's Phoenix Patronus went after the Dementors with a vengeance, chasing them away from the stands and Hogwarts in general. But it seemed that Harry was flying in the rain, and the remote contact from the hundred Dementors before the Patronus got to his aid was enough to make him lose consciousness. The Seeker let go of his broom and started to fall towards the ground. Harry's falling off his broom. He's coming down, Quinn warned the professors so they could slow Harry down and stop his fall. I shall take care of Harry, alerted Dumbledore, the other professors. A blue light was cast from the Elder Wand. The spell darted towards the falling body of Harry Potter and slowed him down, decreasing his speed. Harry came to a complete stop on the ground of the Quidditch field. Quinn stared at the unconscious boy before catching with his eyes the smiling figure of Cedric Diggory and the golden snitch in his hands. Oh, Hufflepuff won the game. Of course, no one heard it because Quinn had cut the magic of the microphone. Quinn West, MC, money, money, money. Eddie and Marcus, roommates. Nay, they are more than roommates, they are bras. Minerva McGonagall, Quidditch nut, quite easy to persuade when it comes to Quidditch. Albus Dumbledore, headmaster. Rage, motherfuckers. Web novel has been shadow banning comments recently. This means that any comment that contains profanities in any form will be automatically deleted. So, if you are commenting with curses and profanities, censor a single letter or get creative. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 82, Fifth Element, Upgrading and Giant Squid. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at hetreon.con.com. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan Lu. Quinn sat in the most comfortable chair he had ever sat in. Everything from the seat height, width, depth, tilt, backrest lumbar support and recline was perfect as far as Quinn was concerned. The materials used in the chair, armrest, and headrest were the best he had ever experienced. For the person who rarely sat in chairs with backrests, this was heaven in a room because Quinn's body was feeling comfort all over. Pulling back a little, Quinn in his chair was in a simple room with a fireplace and a small library. There was a small table beside Quinn's chair with a candle lamp on it providing light. The room screamed of being Quinn's comfort zone. The chair was facing the fireplace and Quinn closed his eyes. His eyes were darting underneath his closed eyelids. Diving into his mind, he saw himself, standing in his mindscape, 
his eyes looking around the mindscape, watching something only visible to him. Many magical cultures used to talk about four classical elements. Classical elements were typically referred to as water, earth, fire, and air, which were proposed to explain the nature and complexity of all matter in terms of simpler substances. Ancient magical cultures in Greece, ancient Egypt, Persia, Babylonia, Japan, Tibet, India had all similar lists, sometimes referring in local languages to the air as wind. These different cultures and even individual magical scholars had widely varying explanations concerning their attributes and how these theories related to observable phenomena like magical cosmology. Sometimes these theories overlapped with mythology and were personified in deities. Some of these interpretations included atomism, the idea of tiny, indivisible portions of matter. Other interpretations considered the elements to be divisible into infinitely small pieces without changing their basic nature. The trials of time and advancement had tested these beliefs in magic, and many magical cultures still believed that these four elements made up the entire material world. Quinn didn't believe in classical element theory because he knew about modern atomic theory. However, he didn't consider the non-magical theory of matter to be the complete and correct interpretation to be the base of all matter because atomic theory didn't take magic into consideration. He had also given the four classical elemental theories a thought, and he wondered if air, water, earth, and fire were magical equivalents to gas, liquid, solid, and plasma. But Quinn's interpretation was shot down after reading about the classical elemental theories from all the cultures. While states of solid, liquid, gas, and plasma shared many attributes with the classical elements of earth, water, air, and fire, respectively, these states were as such due to the similar behavior of different types of atoms at comparable energy levels. Not because they contained a type of atom or building block or a type of substance, but in the classical elemental theory, Quinn had found something interesting, something that he personally believed to be true. Many cultures that subscribed to some form of the classical elemental theory believed in the existence of another element. The non-magical scientists disregarded the fifth element through experimentation. The fifth classical element, known as ether, also spelled ether, aether, or ether, or the other name, quintessence, the material that filled the region of the universe above the terrestrial sphere. Quinn believed the fifth element to be magic itself, the fifth element that was present everywhere, something that the non-magical weren't able to find because they weren't capable of finding it. It wasn't in their heritage to find magic. The prevailing axiom regarding magic was that it was present in living beings. It was present in M, magical humans, other magical species, magical flora, and fauna. Magic was present inside those who were capable of possessing it. The modern magic scholars didn't believe that magic was omnipresent in the environment around them and that magical-enabled species were magic generators. Magic was a supernatural force present inside select beings that allowed them to change aspects of the world at a fundamental level. But Quinn thought differently. He believed that magic was omnipresent and that the fifth element that was apparently disproved, even by the magical communities, was indeed genuine and was magic. While Quinn didn't have conclusive proof about this theory of the fifth element being the magic force, he did have abstract evidence and reasons to believe in the fifth element. The reason he believed in the fifth element being magic, and that it was omnipresent, was the existence of poltergeists. A poltergeist was an indestructible spirit of chaos. They were like ghosts and haunted one specific place at a time. But unlike ghosts, they weren't alive before they died. A poltergeist didn't have a living part in their existence. They were immortal, beings that never had died and never would, as an immortal entity was never alive to begin with. Thus, poltergeists weren't born from anything and just manifested into existence. Humans, animals, plants, and a lot of other species reproduced through procreation. Even the Dementors divided to create another one of themselves. But poltergeists didn't come from their own species. They weren't born through reproduction, but formed out of nothingness. Quinn believed they were from magic, and when certain conditions were met, it would trigger the magic in that place to give birth to a poltergeist. 
The sole existence of poltergeists made the base of Quinn's belief in the presence of an omnipresent element, which he considered being magic. Because if magic wasn't omnipresent, then poltergeists wouldn't be able to manifest into this world. Whether Quinn was right or wrong was far in the future. But right now, Quinn was using the idea of an omnipresent element that existed everywhere in the universe to improve his occlumency. According to Alan, Quinn's defense aspect occlumency was useless if someone could get past his primary and secondary shields without him noticing it. If a stealth infiltration was successful, then Quinn was screwed because beyond that point. The solution to that problem was to add extra features to his occlumency defenses. To detect any foreign mental attack that got past Quinn's shields, Quinn came up with an idea and decided to fill his entire mindscape with an omnipresent substance. Something like the fifth element from the classical elemental theory, but its base properties were to combat foreign mental magic. Quinn had drafted a timeline to set up the invisible yet omnipresent mental element that would elevate his occlumency defense to another level. The first part of the process was to fill his entire mindscape with an invisible matter. The challenges of this stage were that Quinn's mindscape didn't have definite dimensions. It was an infinite space that stretched in all directions, so Quinn needed to figure out how to fill an infinite space with an omnipresent matter. The second challenge was to make the matter invisible in nature that wouldn't be visible to anyone or anything that tried to enter his mind. He had given a thought to turn his entire mind invisible to anyone looking for it, but Quinn wasn't even sure how to do that. He had tried to make his shields work like an invisibility cloak, but that didn't work because Quinn couldn't figure out how to hide something that was so clearly supposed to be present inside of him. Plus, a mindscape was too complex and heterogeneous in nature for Quinn to hide, but in the case of the omnipresent matter, it was homogeneous in nature and relatively uncomplicated enough for Quinn to make things work. Back to the challenge to add the invisible matter to his mindscape, which stretched infinitely in all d directions. Instead of taking the approach of filling a glass with water, Quinn decided to add the invisible matter into the very essence of his mindscape. To add the presence of the invisible matter into the very genetic slash source code of his mindscape. In the months he had been in Hogwarts, Quinn was able to complete this process. He was able to add a naturally existing matter to his mindscape. His mindscape now had an omnipresent matter, encompassing everything from his both replicas to the empty that extended infinitely. Oh yeah, I can feel it, sighed Quinn. He could see and feel the addition to his mindscape. Yeah, this will work, won't it? The first challenge is over, but this is just the start. Quinn moved his eyes around, moving his body to see in every direction. Now I need to make it completely invisible to any mental probe. The second challenge to Quinn's plan of developing his defense was to make the matter invisible to any mental probe. He needed the attackers to be unaware that there was something that was watching them. The motive to do this was to make them drop their guard. Quinn wanted to make them believe that their job was done, and now they didn't need to be sneaky and careful. One of the things Quinn had learned from the second vault was that you couldn't defend against something you didn't know about. So if his attackers didn't know about the invisible matter, then they wouldn't be cautious against it, making the job of the omnipresent matter easier. This is going to be so difficult, whined Quinn in a sing-song voice. Making the matter invisible to the attacker meant that he needed to be better than them. He needed to outskill them and cover all bases so the invisible matter wouldn't show up on any legitimacy detection probes. This is going to be another repeat of my detection layer training. Quinn licked his lip and exhaled a deep breath. This will be a huge part of my next few months. Quinn had developed his detection layer by testing it against various legitimacy attacks, actively trying to detect masked legitimacy attacks until his detection layer was strengthened enough to do it passively. This time around, it will be the opposite, mumbled Quinn to himself as he waved a hand through the air of his mindscape. I have to develop the matter to the point that an attacker won't be able to detect it. Last time around, it was seeking from hide-and-seek. This time, it would be hiding from hide-and-seek. 
When this part of the upgrade was completed, the next part would be the actual defense, where Quinn would change the nature of the invisible matter to hinder foreign mental magic. That would turn the very environment of Quinn's mindscape into a defensive asset, and Quinn had already started on the preparation for the development of a lethal environment. The mental representation of Quinn closed his eyes for a moment, and when he opened them, the sight had changed. Now he stood in the emotional core of his mind. It was an extensive network of small point lights connected to each other, a network that spanned many kilometers if taken in scale to the small mental representation of Quinn. Every tiny point light was some emotion related to an event in Quinn's life. And because of the continuity in a person's life, every event was connected to other events, creating an extensive network. This place differed from the emotional representation that Alan had visited to check on Quinn's emotional status. This was the full expanse. If someone gained access to this part of Quinn's mind, they would have complete control over Quinn's emotions. Phew, I forgot how time-consuming constructing this was, sighed Quinn with a sense of achievement, his hands resting on his waist as he admired his work. There was a cover over the expansive network of emotion that Quinn had spent his entire life feeling. It was the same graphene-inspired defensive layer that Quinn used for his normal defensive layer, which covered his mindscape. Ten layers of interconnected hexagons made a solid cover, prove, and to work against legitimacy attacks. Quinn's primary and secondary defensive shields were over a hundred layers and fifty layers thick, respectively so this shield looked very thin in comparison. But this defensive shield had an additional feature that the original defensive shields didn't have. Faint radiation in the shape of circular waves radiated from every vertex of the expansive hexagon matrix. Thousands upon thousands of vertices radiated a mild radiation, which created a protective layer of radiation that covered the shield layers. All ten protective layers had the same feature, so that resulted in ten layers of radiation. This is working splendidly, whispered Quinn, his work brightly reflected in his eyes. This proves that I can replicate this with the invisible matter. The radiation was a legilimency inhibiting application of a clumency. Its sole purpose was to degrade the mental probes, such that the probe got weaker as it made its way through the layers of shields. Plus, the strength of the radiation got stronger as the probe made its way deeper into the shield because the layers of radiation piled on. Even if I stop now, I can add this to my main shields, and this would push them to another level, a qualitative change. A smile made its way onto Quinn's face as he thought about the future of his defensive shields. Now, I need to figure out how to add this to the invisible matter. I have to think of a name for the invisible material. I can't keep calling it invisible matter. The radiation shields were a proof of concept, but to add this effect to the invisible matter was another challenge that Quinn needed to study up on and figure out how to do. Just thinking about it gives me a mental boner. A whole mindscape turned into an active radiation zone. Yeah, yeah. Quinn repeatedly nodded his head with an excited smile on his face. This is going to be my greatest work. Ooh, I can imagine it the legilimens entering my mindscape and immediately getting hit with radiation and from a source that they can't see. Yeah, I knew this would be good when I figured it out. Slowly the mental attack would crumble and snuff out like a candle flame in a windy night. Quinn made a fist and closed it with a snap, squeezing it tight as if crushing something in his grasp. At the snowy lakeside of the Great Lake, Quinn stood staring at the lake's surface, wondering about the third vault and Neptune. It is definitely Neptune, the god, and I am sure the clue is definitely related to the Great Lake. Would I have to venture out of Hogwarts via the waterway? While building upon the third vault being in water theory, Quinn found out that the Great Lake was connected to the ocean through underground waterways. When he thought more about this information, it made sense because next year, when the Triwizard Tournament was held at Hogwarts, the Durmstrang ship had emerged from inside the lake, and with this piece of information, it made sense. The it is also most definitely referring to water, muttered Quinn, his hands behind his back as he looked at the snow near his feet. I can swallow it, and I can drown in it, 
which is most probably the meaning of devour in the riddle. But there was still something that was missing, and it stopped Quinn from finalizing his reasoning. What the hell is Neptune's bane? This is tied to the Forgotten Dome. I need to know if I am going in the same direction, grumbled Quinn, kicking the snow near his feet. Deep in the bane of Neptune's home, the riddle pointed to Neptune's bane, not Neptune himself, but Quinn still hadn't been able to pinpoint the identity of Neptune's bane. The home of Neptune's bane, it could be possible that the bane's home wasn't in the Great Lake or in water at all. Neptune's enemy might not live in water, it could be somewhere entirely else, and Quinn was thinking about this all wrong. Who or what is the bane? The sound of splashing water gained Quinn's and brought him out his thoughts. He looked up and saw a L, arch tentacle, coming out of the water. The giant squid, mumbled Quinn, looking at the tentacle of one of the Great Lakes residents. Giant squids could reach tremendous sizes and are one of the largest living organisms on Earth. It was strongly suspected that giant squids had magical powers, but there was no evidence because the gigantic cephalopod never showed any signs of performing magic. It was difficult to study the creatures because they were very hard to find and rarely made appearances. The ones that did make the rare appearances attacked those who witnessed them. This particular giant squid was inhabiting the Great Lake on the grounds of Hogwarts Castle, a castle full of children, and it was only allowed to do so because it was a semi-domesticated giant squid. It was very docile and helpful to the Hogwarts students, such as when students fell into the lake during the first year boat ride, it immediately pushed them safely back into the boat. The squid was also known to have played with students, such as when Fred Weasley, George Weasley, and Lee Jordan tickled its tentacles as it was lying partway out of the lake, and to have accepted food from students, such as when it received toast from Harry Potter. Quinn smiled when he remembered that despite the generalized fear of the giant species, a chocolate frog card for Hogwarts' beloved giant squid. The bane of ancient M. Mariners and students at Hogwarts should the latter decide to go for a dip in the lake. Quinn stilled and stuttered as he recalled the chocolate frog card description, partly because he just found the word bane, but partly because of an absurd yet heartbeat-fastening thought that struck Quinn. Neptune, Mariners, giant squid, throaty whispers escaped Quinn as he stared at the giant tentacle. Quinn recalled a description of a legendary monster, a highly popular mythological animal, a legendary sea monster of gigantic size and cephalopod-like appearance, dwelling off the coasts of dangerous waters and terrorizing nearby sailors. The beast that made water travel difficult, scaring the people from setting sail in the vast water, indirectly reducing Neptune's role in Roman religion because they feared the water. Things started to click inside Quinn's mind. He couldn't believe that the creature in front of him was Neptune's bane. It fit, but at the same time, it seemed absurd. Bloody hell! Bloody hell! Bloody hell! Quinn yelled with an astonished expression as he set a palm over his forehead and used his other hand, all fingers pointing at the lone giant tentacle. A large quantity of water splashed everywhere as the giant squid whipped its tentacle against the lake's surface. This is not a giant squid, this is a bloody kraken. Quinn West, MC. Bloody hell. Hogwarts giant squid, peace-loving, kraken. Fiction-only reader, author, release, the kraken. Web novel has been shadow banning comments recently. This means that any comment that contains profanities in any form will be automatically deleted. So, if you are commenting with curses and profanities, censor a single letter or get creative. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 83, First Expedition and Guiding Growth. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my patreon.com slash fiction only reader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan Liu Peng. I need to rethink my life choices, sighed Quinn as he walked towards the Great Lake. It was the start of January and Quinn had just returned to Hogwarts after the Christmas break. The weather was the coldest of the year, snow was falling almost constantly, 
and it covered the entire landscape around Hogwarts in white. In that heavy snow, Quinn was out of the warmth of the castle. He was about to start his expedition to the landlocked freshwater lake that served as a natural reserve for magical marine creatures. Why am I going swimming in January, muttered Quinn to himself as he stomped his foot on the ground. Half a dome of the earth arose from underneath the white snow. Why couldn't it be April or later, or any time that is warmer? Then the water would feel nice. Quinn removed the many layers of clothes he was wearing and stuffed them into a small string bag with a minor expansion charm cast on it, leaving behind a pair of swimming trunks on his body. He tightened the string to squeeze shut the opening and stuck it to the inside surface of the dome. With a tap, the half dome closed itself to form a full dome. Surrounding snow climbed the earth dome, covering it with white to camouflage it into the snowy surroundings. Ha! This is cold, Quinn breathed the chilly wind and exhaled icy mist. His skin was covered with goose pimples. However, Quinn wasn't shivering, nor were his teeth chattering due to the cold. Despite not having cast heating charms on his body, Quinn was used to this level of cold because he had suffered worse in the icy vault. Even though he used blood magic in the vault, he could still feel an amount of chill, so this wasn't that big of a deal to Quinn. Let's do this. Quinn rubbed his hands to generate heat as he waded into the water. Oh yeah, now this cold. He felt the cold water against his skin, searing as though it was fire and not icy water. Quinn sucked in a sharp breath when he felt the chill from the water before his condition returned to normal as heating charms worked their charm to warm up his body. The icy water wasn't cold enough to warrant the use of blood magic. Blood magic was to deal with cold that could literally kill you within minutes. As Quinn walked into the lake, water rose and the depth of the lake increased. Just when the water was at his chest level, a bubble appeared on the lower half of his face, forming a mask covering his nose, mouth, cheeks, jaw, and extended down to his neck. For his first deep water expedition, Quinn had cast a bubble head charm that produced a bubble around the caster's face, giving them a continuous supply of oxygen and allowing them to breathe where they could not otherwise. Submerging himself into the water, Quinn pushed himself off the stone floor and dove into the lake. The bubblehead charm did its work and Quinn was able to breathe normally. Silence pressed upon his ears as he soared over a strange, dark, foggy landscape. He could only see ten feet around him, so, as he swam through the water, new scenes seemed to loom suddenly out of the oncoming darkness. Rippling forests, tangled black weed, wide plains of mud littered with dull, glimmering stones. He swam deeper and deeper, out toward the middle of the lake. His eyes widened, and he stared through the eerily gray-lit water around him and the shadows beyond, where the water became opaque. Small fish flickered past him like silver darts. Once or twice he thought he saw something larger moving ahead of him, but when Quinn got nearer, he discovered it to be nothing but a large blackened log or a dense clump of weed. Light green weed stretched ahead of him as far as he could see, two feet deep, like a meadow of very overgrown grass. Quinn was staring unblinkingly ahead of him, trying to discern shapes through of the darkness. And then, without warning, something grabbed hold of his ankle. He twisted his body around and saw a grindillo, a small, pale green-skinned, horned water demon, poking out of the weed, its long fingers clutching tightly around Quinn's leg, its pointed fangs bared. Quinn sighed under his protective bubble, and a burst of magic from Quinn's foot blasted the tiny water demon away. A small group of grindalos emerged from the weeds and tried to latch onto Quinn, but they crashed into an invisible shield before getting blasted off like the first one. The tiny water demons didn't seem to understand the situation from watching their brethren getting blasted off, as more and more jumped out of the weeds, trying to latch onto Quinn. Their target stood still in his spot and continued to eject them far away from him, pelting them with magic as their green skins grew angry red patches. Quinn didn't run away from the waves of grindylows and just kept shooting at them like it was some fun game, and the tiny suckers kept coming out of the weeds, trying to get their tiny claws on Quinn. Ha ha! This is fun! It's like a first-person shooter, chuckled Quinn under his protection. 
He continued to shoot at them for a couple of minutes before the Grindylows understood what was happening and stopped attacking Quinn. They retreated back into the weeds and froze, peeking at him with their leafy green eyes. Quinn swam away, and after swimming for a while, he turned full circle in the water, the silence pressing harder than ever against his eardrums. Quinn knew he must be even deeper in the lake now, but nothing was moving but the rippling weed. I am lost, thought Quinn, and decided to swim to the surface to gain a sense of his location. Swimming up to the surface, Quinn saw he had swum further to the south and away from the castle. He had moved towards the Hogsmeade train station and the dock from where the first-year students boarded their boats to get to the castle. I need to swim westwards, said Quinn, moving his hair out of his face. Quinn had observed the Kraken's tentacles, and he was able to deduce that the Kraken's main body hung out somewhere to the castle's west. Quinn had given the giant squid being a Kraken theory a thought while he was home. True giant squids, genus Architeuthis one, were deep-sea-dwelling creatures and cannot live in freshwater, such as inland lochs in Scotland. It would not be able to stand the sunlight, pressure, salinity, or lack thereof of the water, the space, or the lack of food. At one point during the books, it was fed bread, which it could not digest. Giant squids also had very tender skin that would break if touched, but the cephalopod giant living in the Great Lake could push out children who fell into the lake. This meant that the Hogwarts giant squid was of a magical species, and the kraken was exactly the creature that would match the magical counterpart of the non-magical giant squid. Lucky that this one isn't a violent ship-sinking monster, but a semi-domesticated, peace-loving school pet that loves to chill, thought Quinn as he dove back into the water and headed west. This time around, Quinn swam a bit higher over the weed to avoid any more grindalos that might be lurking there. He swam on for what felt like at least thirty minutes. He passed over vast expanses of black mud now, which murkily swirled as he disturbed the water. Ugh, this is getting tiring, thought Quinn. He started to feel tired. He had already been swimming for over fifty minutes. I need to learn magic that makes swimming easier, or at least I need to make some diving fins, thought Quinn. Then, he stopped swimming for a second and looked at his feet. The next second, he conjured a pair of swimming fins on his feet. Alrighty, that was easy. Good job. Another ten minutes and Quinn finally caught a glimpse of the kraken's tentacle. The giant and long tentacle laid on the lake's bottom floor and covered a large surface area. He swam up to create some distance between him and the ten tackle and slowly swam forward, watching as the tentacle got thicker and thicker. Merlin's beard. What I saw outside of the water was just the tip of the iceberg, wasn't it? As Quinn felt amazed by the side of the kraken's tentacle. The end of said tentacle slowly rose and crept in the water, moving towards the tiny human who had gotten deep into its territory. And just when it got near Quinn, the tentacle sped up and moved in for the grab. What the he? Quinn, who was busy being amazed at the kraken, suddenly was in the tip of the tentacle in his peripheral vision. The kraken was trying to wrap its tentacle around him. It was trying to trap him. On instinct, Quinn released a magic force field shield which covered him 360, 360 degrees. At first, the tentacle wrapped gently around the shield, but the next second, Quinn felt a tremendous force exerted from the tentacle as it tried to tighten its wrap around Quinn's safeguard. Sage IT. The force field shield strained as Quinn pushed more magic into the force field shield, trying desperately to maintain the structural integrity. The Kraken, who had spotted a tiny human in its territory, wanted to grab him, but it was confused because something was stopping his tentacles from reaching him. It took the Kraken a few seconds to realize that the tiny human had magic around, so it stopped trying to reach the human. What felt like an eternity of struggle to Quinn was just three measly seconds before the squeezing force vanished. Quinn opened his tightly shut eyes with heavy breathing and he felt himself move. Afterwards, he saw that the tentacle wrapped around his shield was lifting him up. What is it doing? Where is it taking me? The tentacle took Quinn out of the water. The force field, which was still active, trapped the lake water inside the force field. From outside, it looked like the tentacle was holding a sphere of water with Quinn inside. 
I need to get away, thought Quinn. He immediately deactivated the force field, and immediately Quinn dropped down towards the water. The tentacle was holding on to the force field, so when Quinn released the magic, the water inside with Quinn slipped away from the tentacle's grasp. Unfortunately for Quinn, the kraken was one step ahead of him. Another tentacle was waiting for him in the water. The second tentacle rose from the lake's surface and captured Quinn in one of its suction cups. Because of the sheer size of the kraken, the suction cups lining its tentacles were huge. Quinn was swallowed inside the suction cup. He was trapped to his neck inside the suction cup. Quinn struggled against the kraken's bounds. He wanted to get out of here and was really tempted to use magic to tear through the kraken's flesh. The only thing holding him back was because even though the kraken had trapped him, it was only trapping him and not choking him out. Plus, the kraken's reputation for decades was one of a friendly and peaceful creature. The kraken's tentacle moved in the air and stopped right over the lakeside. The suction cup holding Quinn released its hold and unceremoniously dropped him onto the ground like a sack of potatoes. Quinn immediately stood up and vigilantly stared at the retreating tentacle. He was sure that the tentacle gave him a wave as it returned inside the water. What in the world just happened? He wasn't sure what happened. Quinn had swum for close to an hour, and just when he finally reached the kraken, Neptune's bane, he was caught and ejected back to the land. Looking around, Quinn found he was on the lakeside, which was near the herbology greenhouses. My clothes bag is in the opposite direction, grumbled Quinn as he peered at the opposite bank of the Great Lake. I don't want to walk. I am so tired. With slumped shoulders, Quinn dried himself off the lake water. He conjured clothes over his body and started the long walk towards the other side of the lake to get his clothes back. Damn it, that was humiliating, thought Quinn as he walked, Ed. He was thinking about what to do next. From today, Quinn had understood that if he got too close to the kraken's body, it would eject him out of the lake. If he wanted to get to the vault, then he would have to get past the kraken. I need to be faster, he thought based on today's events. First, I can't spend half an hour just to get near the Kraken. I need to find a way to get there faster than before. Second, I have to gain control while I am inside the water. The Kraken has too many tentacles, but I have the size advantage. I'm shorter, so I can evade him. To do that, though, I need to gain speed and nimbleness in my swimming. The gears in Quinn's mind turned as he pondered what magic would help him out in this situation. Water magic is definitely a plus, Nothing better than water magic inside water. I could probably use it as jets to increase my speed so I can move much faster. It will also improve the things I can do while I'm under the water. As long as the Kraken doesn't have water magic capabilities, then I will be able to outmaneuver past him. He brushed a hand through his hair and prayed. Let's hope that whatever the vault is, it's inside some kind of building or room because I don't want to work on the vault while continuously evading the kraken, trying to get me out of water. The next part of the problem was Quinn's surviving under the water. A human being like himself wasn't meant to stay in the water for extended amounts of time. Sure, he was athletic enough to swim for a long time, but if he was going to stay deep beneath the surface, then it would become dangerous. The bubblehead charm is not durable enough, it might break if I'm not careful. I can't take that kind of risk, speculated Quinn, and cracked his neck as he continued to walk. I need to find another source of oxygen. This one will need to be more durable and needs to last as long as I need. Quinn had some ideas on achieving the solution to the oxygen problem, but it would need some study and research because his method required some finesse and delicate magic work. This is going to be a fun year. It was late at night inside Quinn, Eddie, and Marcus's dorm room, and all three residents were ready to go to bed. Quinn, do you have any idea about the ministry notice? asked Marcus from his bed. I heard someone talking about a notice. Do you have any idea what it is about? Quinn, who was reading a book on transfiguration from the Caribbean region, closed his book and turned his face towards Marcus. It's about Hogsmeade. The attack by the Novellus Actionites triggered the ministry, so they are taking some precautions, answered Quinn. Then, he got up from his bed. 
He walked to his study table in his dorm room and opened a drawer. He took out a sheet of paper. This is a copy of the notice, informed Quinn as he walked towards Marcus's bed to hand him the paper. Elliot had sent him the copy of the notice by the Magifax installed at the West Manor. The ministry notice was accompanied by a letter. The letter advised that if Quinn wanted things from Hogsmeade, then he should preferably get them by mail order, and if he absolutely needed to visit Hogsmeade, he was to keep his visits short as possible. Marcus received the paper and read the ministry notice. By order of the Ministry of Magic, we have the duty to inform you that, until further notice, Dementors from Azkaban will be patrolling the streets of Hogsmeade every night after sundown. This measure has been put in place for the safety of the Hogsmeade residents and will be lifted when the Ministry brings the terrorist group going by the name of Novellus Axionites. It is therefore advisable that you complete your shopping well before nightfall. Happy and prosperous New Year. Eddie also got curious, so he got up from his bed and walked over to Marcus's bed. He took the notice paper after Marcus was done reading it and read it. Are they serious? Eddie asked as he dropped the notice on Marcus's bed. They are putting G. Dementors in Hogsmeade? Isn't that a little too much? What is wrong with appointing some aurors in the village? I guess they were thinking that if Dementors patrolled Hogwarts, then why not Hogsmeade? speculated Quinn, shrugging as he spoke. It will not be good for business, though. Marcus, who heard Quinn's answer, asked a question in response. Do you think the Ministry is still restricting the DMLE? By placing Dementors at Hogsmeade, are they trying to keep the Aurors away from the case? Marcus recalled the talk he and Eddie had with Quinn regarding the friction between the Ministry and the DMLE. This situation, to Marcus, that is, allowing Dementors to patrol Hogsmeade, seemed like the minister's faction was still trying to restrict Aurora's office's movements. Quinn plopped himself down on Marcus's bed and said, I'm not sure if this is because of politics or because of the Dementors themselves. Dementors, what do they have to do with this? asked Eddie, confused. The situation was because of the minister's faction and the DMLE. He couldn't see how the Dementors fit into this situation. The Dementors feed off from the positive feelings. I don't know their level of sapience, but it is clear that they are sentient enough to taste and sense fear, as they are drawn to it and the promise of positive memories," continued Quinn. They obeyed the Ministry of Magic for years, because in guarding Azkaban they were provided with the sustenance of any remaining hope or happiness from the prisoners. But now a lot of them are away from their food table, Azkaban, and Dumbledore doesn't allow them inside the castle, so they must have been growing restless for some time furious at his refusal to let them inside the grounds. So I suppose the Ministry is trying to appease the Dementors by allowing them to patrol Hogsmeade at night. Marcus rubbed his temple and sighed. This is all so confusing. Some of the conversations that Marcus, Eddie, and Quinn had this year were politics-related, and those conversations made both Marcus and Eddie increasingly involved in politics. Both of Quinn's roommates had started to think about the ministry and what was happening around them. Quinn personally had seen both of his friends exchange thoughts on articles they had read in the newspaper and talk about things they hadn't addressed before. And the divide in the ministry due to the Novellus Axionites was at the forefront in many of their conversations. Why don't you write letters to your parents? Write to them asking what they think about the current situation suggested Quinn, while trying to provide them a way to gain more insight on the topic. Of course, I'm not saying to follow whatever they say. Just hear whatever they have to say and think about how you feel about it. Look up for more facts and get a complete picture. Maybe, then, you will be able to get a clear picture that would erase any confusion. Quinn was trying to make his friends people with critical thinking, people who weren't like the sheep that abounded the British Magical Society. He wanted them to be free thinkers, and given the situation, having them form their own political views was a good start. People like Albus Dumbledore had an image in the public's mind that bordered worship. It made people trust him without giving it a second thought. And one thing George had taught Quinn was that blind trust was just like nails. The longer you have them, the more dangerous they get.
Quinn didn't want his friends to become like the sheep that was everybody. He didn't need yes-men around him who just followed whatever he said. While that sounded good in a way, Quinn wanted the people with whom he interacted to be winners and not losers who couldn't think for themselves. Eddie and Marcus nodded at Quinn's suggestion of writing to their parents, and that brought a smile to Quinn's friends. It was a start. Quinn West, MC, nothing ever goes away until it teaches us what we need to know. Eddie Carmichael, a thinking Ravenclaw, oh, and a path that will set him apart. Marcus Belby, a Ravenclaw seeking answers. Sheep, he will never be. Chapter 84, Interactive Learning and Illusion of Help. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my patreon.patreon.com slash slash fiction only reader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan Le. Humming a pleasant tune, Quinn walked towards his office, ready to start another shift of quality consultation. I wonder how many will come today, wondered Quinn, thinking about what kind of problems he would get to see today. On an average day, Quinn would get maybe two to three customers. They would bring their problems to him, expecting a solution. Let's hope that some of them are non-homework-related problems, sighed Quinn, hoping that something interesting would come along. Homework-related requests consisted of Quinn giving homework-related resources to the clients and charging a few nuts for the information. The problem with this kind of problem was that there was no margin for getting students under his debt. He couldn't do their homework for them, as that would attract unwanted attention from professors. And second, he didn't do his homework. Quinn reached the office door and twisted the doorknob to open the door. He already knew that his assistant was already in there, so he didn't bother reaching for the key. When he opened the door, Quinn saw Luna sitting on his office bar stool behind his table with a client sitting in front of the table. The chime above the door rang, alerting the occupants of Quinn's entrance, causing both of them to look at him. He greeted them. Good evening. Luna, who had her wand tucked behind her ear, waved a hand to Quinn and greeted him back. Good evening. The client simply nodded when he saw Quinn, but didn't verbally greet him. Quinn nodded back in response before silently walking to the workshop door and entering the workshop after unlocking the door. He didn't take over the conversation from Luna and let her deal with the client as talking with people was what he had hired her for. He set his book bag down and removed his robe. Luna knocked on the door before entering the workshop. He has brought an interesting request, informed Luna, twirling a few strands of her hair with her fingers. Quinn had told her to call him if the request was interesting. It had taken some time before Quinn successfully taught Luna what he meant by interesting, but eventually, Quinn and Luna came to the same page on what interesting meant. All right, I'll be there, replied Quinn and asked a question. Are you done with your homework? Uh-huh, I'm done, responded Luna in a sing-song voice. I just need to bottle the potion in a vial for the class. Excellent praised Quinn before asking. What about my assignments? How is the progress on that? Ever since Quinn had hired Luna, he had been giving her topics to study every week. Sometimes it would be theory, other times it would be practical. He had given her easy study topics, asked her to practice spells until she got used to them, or long-term projects like growing herbs and keeping track of their progress. He had been giving her fun stuff like treasure map hunts and riddles, just like Friar gave him, but in place of deadly vaults, he had been placing mystery objects around the castle that Luna needed to find and figure out how to solve slash open them to get the treasure inside. Every mystery object would require some kind of transfiguration, charms, herbology, or potion brewing to open, making learning more fun for the quirky and eccentric Luna. Quinn wanted Luna to learn and utilize more magic, because teenage years were the age where magic grew more rapidly, and he wanted Luna to take advantage of it. He understood that people wouldn't go to the extremes like him by exhausting his magic core every day, but he could make sure that Luna would use more magic while making it fun. All the assignments and projects that Quinn gave Luna were interconnected with each other. Quinn had planned out things, so when she completed her fifth year, L, 
Anna would be done with her N.E.W.T. level education in all subjects other than care of magical creatures' practical portion, as bringing creatures into Hogwarts was a hassle. But if Canon Luna was anything of reference, then he was sure that his Luna would somehow cover that portion on her own. On top of that, he intended to closely monitor her progress to see if Luna was progressing faster, because if she showed more interest in learning, he would put in extra things that he thought she would learn and things that Luna would find interesting. He didn't burden her with complicated things beyond her level or dump lengthy assignments which would eat away all her time. But he wanted to make sure that Luna would complete her NEDUT education by the end of her fifth year, because, by that time, Quinn would be at the end of his seventh year. And that meant graduation, a.k.a. he would be leaving Hogwarts. NEWT level education by the end of the fifth year wasn't much of a challenge because a fifth year student with a wand did have enough focus ability to perform all the seventh year magic there was in the curriculum. And with Quinn making study plans fitting to Luna's needs and aptitude, he was sure that not only would Luna understand NEWT level topics, but she would also have better magic capacity and control than her peers. Luna twirled on the spot and smiled in a fun way. I'm still working on the blank parchment and riddle that you gave me. Quinn smiled as he thought of the riddle and blank parchment. The blank parchment was a secret treasure map, and the riddle was the clue to a potion that would make the treasure map visible, and another indication that would give her a clue on how to open the mystery object that he had hid. I see. Well, keep working on it, said Quinn, ruffling her hair. Now that he had caught up with her, Quinn asked, So what is he here for? Luna's answer put a smile on his face. Now that is an interesting request, all right, smiled Quinn. He knew exactly how to solve the client's problem, but he wasn't expecting this particular request to come through his doors. He walked to the office and looked at the client as he sat down on his bar stool behind his desk. Mr. Longbottom, you have brought one interesting request. Tell me. What made you request something like this from us? On the client's stool sat Neville Longbottom, round-faced, short, chubby, but not overly fat, brown hair. The Longbottom child was clumsy, forgetful, shy, and many considered him ill-suited for Gryffindor House because he seemed timid. He was the other child who qualified to be the prophecy child in Sybil Trelawney's prophecy, as he was the child of the Longbottom couple, who had defied Voldemort thrice. Fortunately, Voldemort had decided to target the Potters first and had set in Harry Potter's fate to be the chosen one. Um, I keep forgetting the password to the common room. So I write the passwords on a piece of parchment in case I forget it, but one of the P prefects caught me as I was looking at my note. Neville's timid voice narrated his story. He was looking down at his lap as he spoke, not making eye contact with Quinn. He dragged me to Professor McGonagall, and she scolded me for writing the password. Then when I returned to the common room, everybody was laughing at me. Neville looked like he was about to cry. Quinn could literally see tears pooling at the edges of his eyes. So you have come to me, a Ravenclaw, to help you with the Gryffindor common room pass. Neville's ears reddened as he heard Quinn's words and cut him by standing from his bar stool and sputtered. I'm sorry, this was stupid. Please excuse me, I will leave. Quinn raised his hand with a smile on his face and stopped Neville. Not at all, Mr. Longbottom. You have a problem and you came to us to get a solution. We strive to solve any problem, so no, this isn't stupid. He gestured for Neville to return to his seat. Please take a seat. I believe I can solve your problem. Neville blinked a couple of times at Quinn before sitting, j down. This time he made proper eye contact with Quinn his eyes flashing with hope. As you said, you always forget the common room password. There is nothing wrong with that, Quinn reassured Neville that this was something very commonplace. I'm sure a lot of your housemates also forget the password and have it written down somewhere. The prefect who caught you might have been having a bad day, and if not that, then we both can agree that he is a jerk. Bad-mouthing a third person behind their back, especially if that person wasn't well-liked, was a proven way to improve relations between two people. Quinn was using it to make Neville feel comfortable and assert that he wasn't at fault. From what I know, 
Gryffindor common room password changes once every three weeks, correct? Neville nodded in response to Quinn's question. Of course, Quinn already knew that. He knew that Gryffindor and Hufflepuff common room passwords changed every three weeks, while the Slytherin common room password changed every other week. He had recon long enough to figure out the change schedules. And you sometimes forget it, so you need a way to remember it. That is what you are asking me, correct? Quinn didn't even go in the direction where Neville didn't forget the password, as that would be a lengthy process that Quinn didn't want to overtake. When Neville nodded, Quinn continued, Excellent, I have just the solution for you. It will allow you to keep a secret copy of the passwords with no one ever finding out. There will be no parchment trail, you just need to make sure that you are alone when you look at it. Quinn stood up from his seat and spoke, Please wait a moment, and I will be back with the solution. He left Neville behind in the office and walked into the workshop. Inside the workshop, Luna was lying on the floor intently staring at the riddle parchment. The parchment was levitating above her, with Luna's wand in her hand. As Quinn walked to a potion cupboard, he stared at Luna. It looked like she didn't notice Quinn walking as she kept staring at the parchment. She's weird, thought Quinn with a smile on his face. Quinn opened a cupboard and searched for a potion vial. It was one of the potions that he had learned to brew before Hogwarts. He brewed it because it sounded fun, and he had all the ingredients lying around. Ah, found it. Taking a vial of inky black potion out of the cupboard, Quinn walked to another part of the room, stepped over Luna's body, and opened a drawer to get a thick calligraphy brush. Once again, Quinn stepped over Luna's body and walked outside to the office, and instead of sitting on his bar stool behind the table, Quinn sat beside Neville in the other client's stool. We're ready said Quinn as he set down the potion vial and calligraphy brush on the table. He turned to face Neville and started. All right, before we start, I would like to explain what is this about in case you don't want to go through this. Quinn needed consent before he did anything. He didn't want complaints after he was done. So this potion is a type of ink that is used on the skin. It is generally used by healers to mark parts on a patient's bodies if ever needed, explained Quinn picking up the vial off the table. But this is a little different recipe. I changed the recipe so that the ink sinks into the patient's body. That way, if the healer has drawn too many lines, they could hide some lines to avoid clutter. You know, small improvements to increase ease of use. Quinn lifted the sleeve of his left hand and placed a finger on his forearm. I'm going to stain a patch of your forearm in this ink and then change it so that it will read the Gryffindor common room password. When you need the password, you can make it appear, and when you're done, you can hide it. Quinn looked up at Neville and asked, Any questions? Will it hurt? asked Neville with a wince in his voice. Not at all, assured Quinn as he picked up the calligraphy brush from the table and showed it to Neville. I'm going to use this brush to paint some ink on your arm. It might tickle, but after that, you won't feel anything. It won't hurt even when you make the ink appear or when you hide it. Neville looked relieved to hear that it wouldn't hurt. Neville thought that Quinn was a cool person, and he didn't want to cry in front of him. Plus, there was that other girl inside. And if he cried, she might come out and see him cry. We need a code word to make the ink appear, said Quinn. He wanted a code word that would reveal the password. Tell me, Neville, what is your favorite tree, herb, plant, or any flora? Neville tilted his head confused, wondering why Quinn was asking like this, but answered nevertheless, Chamomile. Excellent, then that will be your code word, clapped Quinn, smiling at Neville. He knew Neville was a herbology lover, so assigning the code word as Neville's favorite plant would make sure that Neville would never forget it. Or I could have just used his name as the code word, but that is so boring, thought Quinn before speaking. Now, let's get started and ink your forearm. Lift your sleeve and hold it in place. Quinn uncorked the vial and dipped the calligraphy brush into the vial. He waited as Neville clumsily pulled up his sleeve and awkwardly held it in place. All right, let's begin. Quinn removed the brush from the vial and gently painted a stroke back and forth, drawing nothing in particular and just trying to put more and more ink on Neville's hand. After half a minute, 
Quinn felt that the ink was enough for any phrase that would be chosen as the Gryffindor common room password. I think this is enough, said Quinn as he placed the brush on the table and pulled out his fake wand. Placing the wand tip on the inked area, Quinn fake chanted, Immutatio. The ink moved on Neville's skin and took the form of the words, Facta, non verba. As Quinn removed the wand tip to observe the result, Neville asked with his jaw open in shock, How did you know the password? That isn't something you should waste your time thinking about, Mr. Longbottom. Some things aren't meant to be known, and this is one of them. Sometimes not knowing is better. Knowledge can turn into a curse if you're not careful. Quinn's voice was smooth and had a slower-than-usual flow to it, which made his words sound silky. It stopped Neville from trying to continue the questioning. The Gryffindor gulped while nodding, deciding to forget he had asked that question. Please take out your wand and place it on the inked words, instructed Quinn. Neville used the hand holding his sleeve to take out his father's wand, giving Quinn the chance to magically fold Neville's sleeve properly, unlike the awkward, crumpled way Neville had done. Say chamomile to set it as the code word, said Quinn as he once again placed his fake wand tip on the inked words. Neville nervously placed his wand beside Quinn's and spoke, chamomile. The ink flashed, affirming that the code word was set, and immediately the ink disappeared as they sunk into Neville's skin, leaving behind no signs. Try saying the code word to see if it is working, instructed Quinn. Neville spoke chamomile, with his wand tip pressed against his skin, and the words facta, non verba, appeared on his skin. Neville's eyes flashed with happiness as he repeatedly spoke chamomile, making the words appear and vanish on his skin. Thank you, said Neville, a smile on his face. He was relieved that now he wouldn't have to keep a parchment with the password written on it. He could just whip out his wand and would have the password on his hand. No worries, but you will have to come back every time the password changes so I can modify the words. Plus, this ink will slowly dissipate from your body, so you need to come back here to refill the ink. Neville nodded without any discomfort or reluctance. He was ready to come here as long as he was able to keep the password in his hand. What do I have to pay? asked Neville. He was so happy that he was ready to empty his pocket money in to Quinn's hands. Oh, about that. No need to pay me anything, smiled Quinn as he stood up with Neville following him. Quinn extended his hand for a handshake with Neville and spoke. I scratch your back. You'll scratch mine. This was just me helping you out. So when in the future I need your help, help me out. You'll help me out, right, Neville? Neville repeatedly nodded as he spoke. Of course, I will help you. I will help you with anything. This is great. Thank you. Thank you so much. No worries. Come back anytime you want, said Quinn with a kind and helpful smile. After Neville left, Quinn cleaned up things and sat behind his table, thinking about Neville Longbottom's request. While it seemed that Quinn had helped Neville with his request, the truth was that Neville was no better than before he entered the AID offices. Quinn hadn't helped out Neville one bit. What he had provided was just an illusion of help. Neville was now looking at his arm instead of paper. He could still very well get caught if he was careless and someone saw him revealing the password on his arm. Plus, now Neville was under the assumption that he would have to return to AID offices to reset the password and refill the ink in his arm. Neville had gone from simply writing the password on parchment, which he did on his own, to writing the password on his arm, which required Quinn's assistance. Quinn, of course, knew all this, and despite that, had chosen to use such a solution. No, to better phrase it, Quinn had given Neville the solution, knowing that it wouldn't help out Neville. Quinn wanted Neville to retain the problem and repeatedly return to his office to avail his services, as that would enable Quinn to increase the amount of help he handed out to Neville. A day would come in the future when Neville would feel that he had gotten so much help from Quinn that he wouldn't be able to refuse anything that Quinn asked from him. Quinn sat on his bar stool, looking at where Neville had sat as he tapped his fingers on the table. Eventually, a soft closed mouth smile made its way to Quinn's face, like a spider watching a butterfly flying towards its web. Quinn West, MC provided help and is ready to help more. Neville Longbottom, 
Gryffindor, entered the cycle of problem and help. Luna Lovegood, weird, put on an accelerated learning path without her knowing. Web Novel has been shadow banning comments recently. This means that any comment that contains profanities in any form will be automatically deleted. So if you are commenting with curses and profanities, censor a single letter or get creative. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 85, Aquatic Showdown, and Exposed. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon, ashpatreon.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. Sitting by a bank in the Great Lake, soaking his feet in the cold water, Quinn readied himself for another deep dive into the its depths. It had been a few weeks since Quinn had tried to get close to the Kraken. He had been practicing his swimming near the surface, away from the Kraken's main body. He had been practicing his magic so that when he did approach the Kraken once more, he wouldn't be helpless. Well, I'm not exactly helpless. I could injure it and take my chance. Yeah, but that would probably not go my or the Kraken's way, grumbled Quinn, while swinging his soaking feet in the lake water. Quinn was sure that he could reasonably injure the Kraken. Last year, while under the Sin Curse, Quinn had learned a lot of destructive magic and had practiced it even more. The Room of Requirement had dealt with a lot of abuse from Quinn, who had a penchant for destruction. So Quinn was sure that if he turned his magic against the Kraken, he would make the legendary monster feel a lot of pain and rip and detach at least one of its tentacles from its body. But at the same time, Quinn wasn't sure what he would do when it came to defending. The water was the Kraken's territory, his home ground, and Quinn was an outsider, playing an away game, which meant that Kraken had the field advantage. Quinn had done some mental simulations, that is, he had imagined how things would go if he fought the Kraken. In lots of them, he ended up crushed by a Kraken's tentacle, or eaten by the Kraken, or being repeatedly smacked into the lake bed till he was broken and dead. I wanted to say that our battle would be legendary, smirked Quinn but sighed while shaking his head. Alas, it won't happen, but maybe, nah, it won't happen. Quinn stood up and walked into the lake, water climbing up his body as he wadded forward. When his feet no longer touched the ground and had swum a distance from the shore, he stopped himself from floating and let himself sink into the water, disappearing from the surface. In the deep blue and somewhat murky green, he closed his eyes and held his breath. Afterward, Quinn brought his hands to the sides of his neck and sunk deeper into the water. Magic flowed in his body and thrummed as it showed its charm. Quinn opened his mouth and let water flow in, and a few seconds later, bubbles emerged from beneath Quinn's hand. He opened his eyes and put away his hands from his neck, which revealed three large slits just below his ears, flapping in the cold air. Gills were a respiratory organ found in many aquatic organisms that extracted dissolved oxygen from water and expelled carbon dioxide. Gills were tissues that were like short threads, protein structures called filaments. Each filament contained a blood capillary network that provided a large surface area for exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. Human transfiguration was a sub-branch of transfiguration and a kind of transformation where one transfigures human body parts or an entire human being into another form. Human transfiguration on oneself was an arduous process because you added organic parts to the human body that weren't part of the original human physiology. If not performed correctly and carefully, then the caster would be in a world of complications. Adding gills to himself for oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange under the water was a simple enough idea that Quinn borrowed from Harry Potter and Victor Crumb's performance in the second task of the Triwizard Tournament. Harry had used gillyweed, a magical plant, to achieve underwater breathing. When eaten, it gave the consumer gills, allowing them to breathe underwater and webbing between the fingers and toes, allowing them to swim underwater with ease. Victor Crumb chose to attempt human transfigure on himself and tried to transform himself into a shark, but managed only to transfigure his head. Still, it worked well enough for him to reach the merpeople village because the shark head had gills that allowed him to breathe underwater. 
So Quinn combined both of those examples and gave him a pair of gills without turning into another species. He studied the anatomy of the gills from multiple aquatic species before he was able to clearly understand how the gills worked. From there on, Quinn had to transfigure gill structures with filaments that had a blood capillary network. He connected those capillaries to his own natural blood vessel network. Finally, he blocked his windpipe so that the water wouldn't go in his lungs and diverted to the gills, completing an artificial aquatic respiratory system in his body. The first gulp of icy lake water felt like the breath of life. He took another swallow of water and felt it pass smoothly through his gills, sending oxygen back to his brain. The oxygen circulation was established and Quinn's body got a healthy dose of oxygen from the water. All right, everything seems to be working fine, thought Quinn, in taking more water to suck the oxygen out of the liquid. The gill flaps closed when Quinn took in water, and his mouth shut when the gill flaps opened to let out the water. Good, let's go. Quinn's magic leaked into the surrounding water, causing it to react with a short wave of vibration before it settled down to normalcy, but Quinn knew that it wasn't back to normal. With a single thought, the water reacted and pushed Quinn forward. He left behind a jet of water as Quinn's speed in water increased, and he zoomed across the lake towards the largest resident of the area. If you looked closely, it'd be possible to see Quinn covered in a teardrop-shaped envelope of calm water, as the turbulent water around that stable envelope made Quinn move inside the lake. After practicing for a few weeks, Quinn had learned a lot about using water magic to practice underwater swimming. Quinn had found that he needed to maintain calm water around him, as steady and stable water was ideal for proper oxygen circulation. The turbulent water hindered Quinn's ability to take in water, so to solve that, he tried many options, like covering his face with stable water, but that failed the integrity test and would turn turbulent after a certain speed. After many tests and configurations, Quinn had found that covering his entire body with a teardrop-shaped stable water cover was better, as not only did it pass the integrity test, it also spared Quinn's body from the water resistance he experienced while learning how to use water magic for swimming. Hydrodynamics for the win, smiled Quinn as he exerted more magic, pushing his speed up as he moved towards the Kraken. What previously took tens of minutes of physical swimming, now with the help of water magic, it took under five minutes for Quinn to start from his usual starting point to where the Kraken usually resided. There it is, thought Quinn, as a tentacle entered his sight. Quinn stopped at a distance away from the tentacle and took a moment to form his plan. This would be his second encounter with the Kraken, although this time his goal was to at least make sure that the Kraken didn't touch him. That was all he wanted to accomplish today. Let's start. Quinn cracked his knuckles underwater, and the water once again formed a teardrop around Quinn. Quinn then contracted his body before extending it straight and shot himself towards the Kraken. Immediately, the Kraken's tentacle twitched as it felt a tiny human moving towards him at a faster speed than before. The next second, two tentacles rose from the lake floor and shot towards the smaller figure in the water. Quinn, who registered the twin tentacle pincer attack, immediately shot upward to avoid a tentacle. The next second, though, the other tentacle went upon Quinn, ready to grab him. Oh no, I'm not going to the surface soon, thought Quinn. The water magic showed its maneuverability advantages as the teardrop cover narrowed. Water forces from different direct DI ons came into play, and Quinn moved towards the incoming tentacle, intending to escape its grasp with an aggressive approach. Quinn and the tentacle close on to each other, and at the last second, Quinn spun around the cylindrical body of the tentacle, leaving behind coils of water propulsions around the tentacle's body as he zoomed forward. Yes, celebrated Quinn, as he put in more magic into speed and zoomed towards the Kraken's main body while intending to see its face. But the thing about tentacles is that they don't work like hands. They weren't single-jointed limbs and could fold and turn at any point of their length. And the Kraken knew it better than anyone else. So when Quinn escaped its first attempt, both tentacles immediately moved, turning towards Quinn and darting with speed to catch up with Quinn like homing missiles. Quinn, who was zooming forward, 
felt something behind him and saw that the tentacles he dodged were once again on his tail, and they were much faster than Quinn, so the distance was shortening as he watched them. He knew running away wasn't going to work for long, so he decided to use another branch of magic, a magic that had a massive advantage in his current situation. Turning his body towards the tentacles while still moving away from them, Quinn took a deep breath of water and called upon his magic. The magic from his magical core shot out into the water and waited for Quinn to give the command. Quinn waited. He waited for the tentacles to get closer and closer to each other as they moved nearer to Quinn, patiently watching for the right moment. When they were just about the distance Quinn wanted them to be, he dwelled deep into his memories. Ice. That single word brought him the memories of the chilling freeze of the icy vault, all the time he had spent in the area, feeling the cold seep into his bones. Just for the moment, Quinn felt that he was back in the icy vault, working on the snowflake icicle, trying to get inside the vault. Ice. With that thought, the magic got the command it was waiting for, and it made the wish come true in reality. Ice bloomed in the Great Lake, Two giant bands of ice formed around the two tentacles, working as cuffs when the ice from the band shot towards each other, meaning to lock the tentacles with each other, causing them to slow down and snatch against each other. In an environment where water was everywhere, where the base material for making ice was in so much abundance, Quinn's ice magic worked with greater ease. He was able to push it to greater heights than he had ever reached. More and more ice bands formed around the surface of the tentacles, weighing them down as they locked them to each other. With a smirk on his face, Quinn raised an arm up, and a gigantic upward-curving ice barrier formed just as a third tentacle tried to capture Quinn from above. Ha! I was expecting that, reveled Quinn as he made a fist with his raised hand. The third tentacle, which collided with the barrier, started to freeze as ice formed on its surface climbing up at an alarming rate. But the next things Quinn saw wiped the smirk off Quinn's face. The initial two tentacles, sinking down because of the ice, moved and tugged to opposite sides. Immediately, there were cracks and crevices appeared in the ice constraints. Quinn's eyes widened as he saw the cracks in the ice. In response, he concentrated his magic to fill those cracks with more ice. But as he did that, he felt something on his side and when Quinn moved his eyes to the side, he saw a fourth tentacle darting towards him. Motherfuck! Quinn tried to curse as he formed an ice sphere around him. And just as the ice sphere was about to complete, the collision with the fourth tentacle happened, sending the ice sphere with Quinn inside, rushing to the opposite direction. Shit! He shouted, but underwater, all that did was to create a gurgle. The whirling ice sphere stole Quinn's balance, and he tumbled inside for a good couple of seconds before he exerted magic and dissolved the eye, the sphere leaving Quinn's body flailing. It took another few seconds before Quinn could regain balance, but he was still moving uncontrollably. Turning back to the direction he was drifting in an attempt to stop himself, Quinn came into another shock. Crap! The Slytherin common room was a dungeon-like room with greenish lamps and chairs. This dungeon extended part way under the lake, giving the light in the room a green tinge. The room had lots of low-backed, black and dark green, button-tufted leather sofas, skulls, and dark wood cupboards. One of the wooden tables had a wizard's chest set on it. The common room was decorated with tapestries featuring the adventures of famous medieval Slytherins. It had quite a dignified atmosphere, albeit quite a cold one. Daphne Greengrass, her sister, Astoria Greengrass, and Tracy Davis were sitting in there. Tracy and Astoria were playing a game of wizard's chess while Daphne was reading a book. There was no one else in the spacious area. So except for the occasional crosstalk between Tracy and Astoria, the only sounds in the room were the ticking of a clock, moving of chess pieces, and turning pages. The three occupants were comfortable in the room's tranquility until a heavy thump broke it. All three girls jumped in their chairs and looked at each other before hastily looking towards the source of the shattering thump. The three girls saw a person pressed up flat against the glass panels that showed the underwater view of the Great Lake. Tracy blinked a couple of times, squinted her eyes to thoroughly look at the person, 
and her eyes opened when she recognized the person. Quinn. The Greengrass sisters' jaw dropped when it clicked in their minds, and now they could see that the man dressed only in shorts was the Ravenclaw and their friend, Quinn West. What in Slytherin's name is he doing there? asked Astoria as she moved towards the glass panels. Are those slits on his neck? pointed out Daphne when she noticed his gills. Tracy and Astoria turned to Daphne and looked at her with a face that said, That is the first thing you notice? Quinn, who was on the other side of the glass, opened his eyes to see his three Slytherin friends. The three girls watched as Quinn's eyes widened when he noticed them. They saw his jaw drop in shock and then the banging of his head against the glass. Quinn slapped his hand against the glass and they saw the reddish-yellow glowing words form on the glass. Not a word to anyone. After a moment, another line formed below the first line. Not a word. The words stayed there for a few seconds before they disappeared, and the girls saw Quinn push against the glass and swim away. He didn't say goodbye, commented Astoria as Quinn disappeared away from their sights. This time the older girls looked at Astoria and made faces that said, That is what you say first? Quinn's sudden visit surprised the three girls enough for them not to notice that he didn't have a wand in his hand. At least then, that is. Scene break. Quinn didn't encounter the kraken during his journey back to the shore. Just before he got out of the water, Quinn's transfigured gills disappeared, and so did other modifications. He brought his face out of the water and took a couple of deep breaths through his mouth till his lungs were once again filled with oxygen-rich air and performing as normal. Walking out of the lake, Quinn laid down on the ground and groaned for a good minute before opening his eyes and sighing. I just wanted a peaceful year, and now this happens. While he was sure that Daphne, Tracy, and Astoria wouldn't speak about it to anyone else, he didn't want them to know. A secret was strongest when only one person knew about it. Quinn had no plan of telling them anything about the vault or what he was actually doing there but he was sure that he was going to have a talk with them. I need to think about what I am going to tell them. Quinn sighed, and then his mind went back to Toda, wise encounter with the Kraken. Damn it, that Kraken is a toughie. The number of tentacles is just not fair. I need to get more practice, sighed Quinn before some other things. I need to change some things. Yeah, definitely change some things. The second encounter with the Kraken ended up a failure. Quinn West, MC, fought the tentacles. Hogwarts' is giant squid, Kraken, tricky tiny human, mph, Daphne Greengrass, Slytherin number one, slits, but why? Tracy Davis, Slytherin number two, it is too cold for a swim, isn't it? Astoria Greengrass, Slytherin number three, didn't speak goodbye, how rude. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 86, Hosting the Slytherin 3 and Wormtail If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my head. The thing about the ambience of the AID office was that the room was designed to make the people who came in feel comfortable. The entire room was set up to create a comforting and inviting environment. It had a lot of elbow room to make the clients feel that the room was spacious and not stuffy. At the same time, the number of knickknacks, decor, and paintings gave the illusion of being in a small space that made the room feel cozy and safe. The walls were painted in a light blue to make the clients more agreeable and relaxed. The plants placed in the room were carefully chosen to provide a fresh aspect to the ambience, making the room feel more organic. The room's entire purpose was to make the person who came in feel comfortable enough to open up about their troubles, to provide a safe space that put them at ease. And the things that tied it everything in the room were the main focus in the room, the host, the person who owned and operated the place. And currently, that host was totally focused on maximizing the comfort level of the people sitting in front of him. Please make yourselves comfortable, stated Quinn with a calm smile on his face. Do you girls want something to drink? I have butterbeer, gilly water, soda, or milkshakes. 
I have lots of fruits that you can choose from. The eyes of two of the three girls sitting in front of Quinn shined. They spoke up. I want a butterbeer, asked Tracy with a shine in her eyes and joy in her voice. She had some butterbeer for the first time at Hogsmeade and enjoyed it very much. So when Quinn offered, she jumped at it. Gillywater, please, replied Astoria from her chair, looking at the various knickknacks and paintings. The third girl sighed at her two companions before replying. Nothing, thank you. Quinn stood up from behind his desk and walked to his workshop. When he came out with a bottle, each of butterbeer and gillywater. Daphne, are you sure you don't want anything? asked Quinn as he put down the chilled bottles on the coasters on the table in front of Tracy and Astoria. I can brew a pot of tea if you don't want something cold. I have a variety of tea leaves that you can pick from. I would like to know what were you doing in the Great Lake, asked Daphne, making clear eye contact with Quinn. Straight to business. I can respect that, said Quinn, sitting back down on his bar stool. Ahem, what I was doing in the Great Lake? Well, I was swimming, replied Quinn, after clearing his throat, hoping that this would clear every doubt. But Quinn knew that he was kidding himself. In late January, persisted the blonde green grass, with a tone laced with skepticism. She didn't believe Quinn would go for a simple swim in the icy waters. Quinn matched eyes with Daphne and answered with a straight face. Yes, one warming charm, and I was all set for a nice swim. What about the gills beneath your ears? Why were you using magic that isn't taught until the sixth year? asked Daphne, pushing for more information when she heard the short answer from Quinn. Quinn snorted and scoffed at those words. He bragged with self-confidence laced in his tone. I'm the smartest student at Hogwarts. Year restrictions have never stopped me and never will. I wanted to go deep diving, so I gave myself a pair of gills, nothing complex. He took out his fake wand with his right hand and waved it to perform magic on his left hand. The digits of his left hand twitched, lengthened a bit, and gained another joint. Flexing his fingers, Quinn showed the girls his fingers with three interphalangeal joints and a thumb with two joints. I have enough mastery over magic to perform partial human transfiguration over limited parts of my body, boasted Quinn. Even if he was boasting, Quinn was still holding back what he was capable of. He was more advanced than what he was letting on. Now that I think about that, I need to improve on that thing, thought Quinn. He needed to make certain changes before he went back for another confrontation with the Kraken. The younger Greengrass was holding the bottle of gilly water with both her hands and was looking at the bottle's label when she asked, Then why did you crash into the glass? All three girls remembered the shocked expression on his face when he was pressed against the glass. Quinn was clearly not expecting to be there nor wanted them to see him, so something had happened when he was swimming, and with Astoria's question, all three stared at Quinn, expecting an answer. The little one knows how to talk. Of course, that would turn in the other direction, thought Quinn with a straight face before speaking. I kind of got flicked by the giant squid when I was running away from a flurry of grindalos. The giant squid took me by surprise, so I ended up casting a spell at it, and then it flung me away with its tentacle because of that spell. To keep his story believable, Quinn decided to stick to the facts that he had experienced. He regularly met Grindelows while he practiced his water magic and ran away from them to practice his speed, and the Kraken did push him away because of the ice magic. By spinning his actual experiences into fake explanations, Quinn was making sure to establish a believable story, plus it allowed him to present it believably and confidently. And since this could be seen as dangerous, I asked you three not to tell anyone, finished Quinn rolling his eyes as he air-quoted the word dangerous. Quinn was handing the girls the initiative, but anything that followed was under control. He waited for any question because that allowed him to answer questions they bothered to ask and not anything extra that he might speak about if he took the lead. Can we also go swimming? That would be fun, suggested Tracy, thinking about playing in the water, having fun. Quinn grabbed the opportunity when he saw it and steered the conversation in the presented direction. Sure, I can teach you a simple bubblehead charm that would allow you to breathe underwater, but whether you're able to learn it, it is up to you. 
and if you guys do learn it, let's do this when the weather gets warmer. I don't want you guys to get sick. Eh, but you went for a swim in the cold. Why not us? whined Tracy, slightly frowning towards Quinn. It will take you a lot of time to learn the bubblehead charm if you are able to learn it. The spell is a sixth-year charm, reasoned Quinn, ignoring the glare from Daphne. He knew the glare was, because he had just said that year restrictions didn't hinder him, and now he was saying that they wouldn't learn it because it was a higher year spell. If you want to go for a swim at the surface, that doesn't warrant the bubblehead charm. The water is freezing, you know, even with the warming charm, you still feel the cold against the skin. Believe me, most people don't like it. I didn't mind it, but I'm not sure if you'd like it. Quinn wasn't lying about the cold against the skin. He felt the bitter chill against his skin the entire time he was inside the lake. Quinn didn't heat the water envelope around him to make himself comfortable because he just didn't mind the cold and was used to it, but not all could stay in that cold. While saying that, the workshop's door pushed open, and Luna came skipping out with a large sheet of old parchment in her hands. I did it, she exclaimed, looking at Quinn, unrolling the parchment and showing a detailed map drawn on the parchment. It was mud rue based ink. It reacted with pita cori and ephemeg tarring potion. Luna giggled as she pushed the parchment near Quinn, showing it to Quinn. The blonde Ravenclaw wasn't even looking at the three Slytherin girls. Quinn took the map parchment from her and gave it a look over. From Luna's excited reaction, Quinn knew that she had gotten the correct potions and herbs. He still observed the parchment to judge the quality of her brew, as he wanted to determine her progress in potion brewing, and he was pleased to see that she had done a more than decent brew for her first time brewing the potion. Good job, Luna, praised Quinn, smiling at the parchment before smiling at his friend, junior assistant. And you are right, it was Pidecori and Ephemeg tarring potion. It was in the riddle. It was so clear when I finally noticed. You hit it so cleverly, beamed Luna, swinging with joy in her spot. She was so happy that she couldn't contain herself. Quinn handed the map parchment back to Luna and spoke. How about you go and explore with the map? Revealing the map was only step one. You still have to find the treasure. Really, exclaimed Luna, but then she looked back at the workshop and spoke. Her voice didn't have as much excitement as before, but I still have to clean up the equipment I used. Quinn chuckled and responded, I will clean it. You go and have fun. Luna squeed and gave Quinn a tight hug before turning to the office entrance. She was about to rush out when she saw that Quinn had company. Hi greeted Luna when she saw the three girls, immediately following the greeting with, Bye! And with that, she rushed to the door. Don't run in the hallways, shouted Quinn, just before she exited. Okay, was all Luna said before she was gone. Daphne, who had turned her head to look at Luna, who had rushed out, turned it back towards Quinn and inquired, She was in there the entire time? Hmm. Oh yeah, she's been spending a lot of time in there, brewing potions answered Quinn as he walked back to his barstool after closing the workshop door. And why does she brew potions in there and not in the potion wing? asked Daphne, looking between the workshop door and Quinn. The potion wing in Hogwarts were multiple classrooms with potion workstations where students could practice potion brewing. Oh right, not many people know it, but Luna is my employee. I hired her as my assistant, answered Quinn. He was still smiling because of Luna's progress with the learning quest he made for her. She gets to use the space behind the wall. What is behind the wall? Astoria chirped in, curiosity evident in her eyes as she looked at the workshop's red door. That's a secret, smiled Quinn in response. Many people had asked Quinn about the area behind the wall, and all of them had different ideas about what was behind there. Some thought it was a storage room because Quinn brought out their orders from inside. Others assumed it was empty because they never saw Quinn go back there. Now some people like Daphne, Tracy, and Astoria knew that there was at least a potion workstation inside. But no one except Quinn, Luna, Ivy Potter, and whoever she told knew what was actually knew what was inside. Oh, come on, tell us, inquired Tracy. Now that Quinn refused to tell them, it stirred her curiosity. Maybe another day. I'll give you a tour of what is behind the wall. I will say this, though. 
Behind the wall, you'll find something enjoyable and of your liking, grinned Quinn, enjoying himself as he increased the allure of the unknown place behind the glass wall and watching how a three girls became even more curious. Tracy and Astoria shifted in their seats, while Daphne narrowed her eyes at the red door. The three wondered what there was inside and had a mental image of what was behind the wall. Phew, at least now they aren't thinking about what I was doing in the lake, sighed Quinn, feeling relieved that he was successfully able to divert the whole situation. I somehow need to thank Luna and her timing. What does she like? Ah, she likes to paint. Okay, then I need to find out what kind of paints and brushes she uses and get a new assortment for her. To make sure that they don't return to yesterday's incident, Quinn shifted the topic of conversation. So, Astoria, tell me what Daphne is like at home. The younger sister's eyes shined as she opened her mouth and things flew out. The older sister was quick on the outtake and tried to stop her sister. Tracy and Quinn sat back and laughed at the sisters. In a cursed building that looked like no one had occupied for years, as there were broken windows, stripped paints, exposed bricks and cracks creeping across the outside, making the building unpleasant to the eye. If the building's facade was in bad shape, then the inside was worse. There were broken tiles, paint falling from every wall, exposed pipes, broken and left behind furniture, mold, and spider webs in every corner. The insides were so dusty and covered with fallen building material that no patch of the floor was empty. It was a building that even the most impoverished squatters would avoid. In that same building lied a man, a dangerously skinny and skeletal-looking man. The man looked sickly and pale like he hadn't eaten properly in months. The man was exceedingly short, no taller than the average 13-year-old child, with pale grubby waxy skin, small watery eyes, a pointed nose, sunken cheeks and eyes, yellow teeth, and a balding head of reddish hair. If someone looked at the man at the very moment, they would think that the man was a corpse that had died in the building. But the man was no corpse. This man was the greatest betrayer in recent history. Peter Pettigrew Peter Pettigrew was called by some of his former friends as Wormtail. He began attending Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry in 1971 and was sorted into Gryffindor House after the sorting hat pondered over which house he belonged in for over five minutes, a true hat stall. During his years at Hogwarts, he became one of the Marauders. He was best friends with Sirius Black, James Potter, and Remus Lupin, and together they created the Marauders map. During the First Wizarding War, Peter was a member of the Order of the Phoenix, but became a spy when he got forced into joining Lord Voldemort. He was made the secret keeper for the Potters when they went into hiding with the Fidelius charm. But he betrayed James, his wife Lily, and their children Harry and Ivy to Lord Voldemort. Leading this to the death of Euphemia and Fleamont Potter, the parents of James Potter. After Voldemort's fall, he tried to fake his own death and frame Sirius for betraying Fleamont and Euphemia, as well as for his own murder and those of the twelve muggles he killed during his escape. But Sirius Black was sharper and more magically capable than Peter and saw through the deception and caught the rat. Peter was arrested by the Department of Magical Law Enforcement and sentenced by Barty Crouch Sr. to life imprisonment in Azkaban. He was charged of twelve crimes of murder with the killing curse and for giving the information about the Potter's whereabouts, which lead to their death by the hands of Lord Voldemort. Peter was placed in solitary confinement at the mercy of the Azkaban guards, the Dementors. But the rat was persistent and had cockroach-like tenacity. That tenacity to live could not be detected by the Dementors, but still allowed him to maintain a sense of self and regain enough strength to transform into his animagus form in his cell. Since Dementors have difficulty sensing the less complex emotions of animals, he could remain relatively unaffected as a rat. It was not trouble at all to the immortal guards, though, since they thought it meant he was losing his mind like every other convict in their custody, including Bellatrix and some of her fellow Death Eaters. Peter spent twelve years living in his animagus form in Azkaban. Just a few months ago, he seized an opportunity and became the only known person to escape the prison unassisted. He did it by transforming into his animagus form of a rat. 
The decision to escape after 12 years of imprisonment was the news he had heard from the guards. A new terrorist group had been causing chaos outside in the real world. The group had caused stress on the Auror's office to deploy Aurors to patrol Muggle areas to Gua, RD the unaware Muggle population from any surprise attacks. For the first time in a long time, Wormtail mustered whatever courage he had and decided to escape the hell of the place he was living. The motivation of that escape wasn't to better his own life, but to make someone else's life miserable. In his 12-year incarceration, his former friend, Sirius Black, had regularly visited him to gloat and give him regular news about how great his and his other friend's lives were. Peter couldn't help but hear what Black would tell him about the fame, prestige, and happiness they had gotten after the war. He bragged about how everyone knew about them while he was dumped there in filth, forgotten by everyone. In twelve years, Peter developed an obsession and hateful loathing towards his former friends. He hated Sirius because of his regular visits, and hated James and Lupin because they didn't even bother to visit him. He thought that the latter two couldn't even be bothered to visit him because of their glamorous lives. Obsession wasn't something that Dementors could detect, and that was why he kept his sanity even when the Dementors sucked everything worth living for out of him. So for the first time, Peter took action without knowing what laid in his future. He escaped Azkaban to get back his former master to the top so that Voldemort would burn down his former friends to the ground and he could be there as Voldemort did it. He didn't know if Voldemort was even alive, but spending a lot of time in Azkaban with nothing but his thoughts made him convinced that Voldemort was still alive. The sole aim of his life became to see the Black, Potter, Lupin, and therefore the Order of Phoenix to be destroyed. He wanted anyone who opposed Voldemort to suffer because it was their fault that Voldemort had fallen and robbed him of a glorious future. In the broken-down building, Peter Pettigrew opened his gaunt eyes and in them was a strong fire of hatred. Quinn West, MC, Master Conversationalist. Luna Lovegood, Assistant, on an adventure of her own. Daphne Greengrass, Witness Number One, Surprised to see Quinn working closely with someone. Mray Tracy Greengrass, Witness Number Two, Curious like a cat about what is behind the wall. Astoria Greengrass, Witness Number Three. So Daphne has this small blanket that she hug. Web Novel has been shadow banning comments recently. This means that any comment that contains profanities in any form will be automatically deleted. So if you are commenting with curses and profanities, censor a single letter or get creative. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 87, Third Encounter and Fail to Succeed. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon and dot com com slash fiction only reader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan Liu. After spending a few hours every day underwater for months inside the Great Lake, Quinn had gotten used to the water so much he felt it was just another part of his life. Everything, from moving his body underwater to how to breathe with gills, had become natural to Quinn. He no longer felt that water was outside of his comfort zone. Just two weeks ago, he had been smacked by the Kraken and had ended up revealing himself to Daphne, Tracy, and Astoria. But with some work and luck, he had been able to put that incident behind him. Now Quinn was ready to get another dig against the Kraken. Within two weeks, Quinn had done more practice with water magic and human transfiguration, and he had become better at both fields. His progress with human transfiguration was clearly visible in his body. Previously, Quinn had had three pairs of gills that allowed him to breathe underwater on his neck and underneath his ears. But now he had a more complex underwater respiratory system. Instead of the three-neck pair of gills, Quinn had made himself a more extensive system, with another six pairs of gills on his chest placed between the opening of the bones in the rib cage, connecting them to his lungs. Inside his body, Quinn had opened up his windpipe to let water in and had layered his lungs to prevent them from getting irritated and protected both the bronchus, bronchioles network, and alveoli branches from getting in contact with water. 
He had transformed his lungs into a water chamber where water could enter from his windpipe, reach the lungs, and exit through the gills, leaving behind oxygen in his blood. What prompted this change was that Quinn's body was large and needed more oxygen. Quinn had noticed that when he tussled with the kraken, he was getting out of breath as he moved rigorously in the water and used a lot of magic. Even though Quinn was using water magic to move around, there was still a physical aspect to his underwater swimming. During his skirmish with the kraken, Quinn had to make lots of movements quickly in a short amount of time, which left him feeling out of breath. That induced him to gulp down a lot of water to gain the sufficient amount of oxygen. It took some practice and reading, but Quinn managed to get it done, and even after performing crazy moves underwater, he didn't feel the lack of oxygen in his body. And now that he was ready, Quinn cruised towards the Kraken's primary location, next while speeding at a velocity faster than the last time he had tried to get past the Kraken. This time, I need to find a sign of the area where the third vault is kept, thought Quinn, as he pumped more magic to increase his speed. It's going to be different this time. And things turned out to be different. Just as Quinn was about to reach the point where he could usually see the Kraken's tentacle, instead of seeing a tentacle laying on the lake bed, Quinn saw two tentacles moving directly towards him. Oh shit, screamed Quinn in his head as he saw the Kraken taking the initiative in their third meeting. Punching the proverbial brakes, Quinn commanded the water to come to a stop and immediately swam upwards to avoid the two tentacles. That was close, his thoughts of relief shattered when Quinn saw five more tentacles appear in his zone visibility and zoom towards him. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Quinn's magic thrummed into life as more and more of it was released into the water, bringing the water under his control. With the water at his service, Quinn swam at faster and faster speeds, making tight breaks in water and maneuvering sharp direction changes on the dime, all in the attempt to stay away from the grasp of the kraken. Damn, I wasn't expecting, thought Quinn dodging another tentacle jab. Such aggression and momentum from the kraken. As seven tentacles wriggled and moved in the water, trying to catch something much smaller and weaker than them, Quinn was getting more confident in his ability because he wasn't feeling the pressure like the last time. Let's drop some freeze in here, thought Quinn, as ice magic made another appearance and walls of ice manifested from the freezing of the lake water, held in place by Quinn to deflect and block the tentacles that were getting a little too close for comfort. But because of the speedy casting of magic, while evading the continuous and tenacious attack of the tentacles, Quinn could only create ice walls that could stop a tentacle once, and a second hit would cause them to crack and break. I need to find an opening to dive in closer, planned Quinn as he shifted to his left, avoiding an incoming tentacle, simultaneously creating two ice walls to block two tentacles. One ice blockade for the tentacle coming from the left, and the second wall for the tentacle that he had just dodged, which was coming back from his back. Quinn swam up before the ice walls broke and alertly looked for an opening while still keeping an eye on the tentacles, because while he was successfully evading the kraken's grasp, Quinn didn't know when the tables could turn. There it is, yelled Quinn as he saw an opening straight ahead. All the tentacles were far enough for Quinn to sprint full speed and without getting caught by them. Just to be sure, he barraged a near hundred ice spheres in all directions in an attempt to stall the tentacles. Go, with a mental yell, Quinn zapped forwards, but not even three seconds in his full-speed swim sprint, two new tentacles appeared in front of Quinn. Hell no. Quinn had enough and clapped his hand in front of himself, and immediately the surrounding water with Quinn in the center turned black. Waves and waves of black erupted, covering everything in inky black. He had released so much magic in a low-costing color change spell that it was slightly visible on the Great Lakes surface if someone was paying attention. To make sure that he didn't get in contact with tentacles by accident, Quinn dropped down to the lake bed and started to swim close to the surface. The damn kraken took me by surprise. Quinn wasn't a great fan of his current situation. He had been avoiding both of the actions he had just taken because of the disadvantage that they put him in. 
turning the water into a color that reduced visibility did provide Quinn cover from the Kraken, but it also heavily reduced away his own ability to see in the water. Plus, Quinn wasn't sure if the Kraken had some form of water perception. If it did, then his effort was a waste. Second, Quinn avoided swimming close to the lake bed because it took away his ability to move downwards. He had been staying a good distance above the lake bed because that allowed him to move in any direction, a 360-degree movement possibility. But now, with him swimming so close to the lake bed, Quinn had lost a variety of evading options. Don't let it find me. Don't let it find me. Don't let it find me, repeatedly chanted Quinn in his mind as he carefully and silently swam forward. Three tentacles suddenly came from above and stabbed the ground behind Quinn. Did it find me? Did it find me? Did it find me? Did it find me? Shit! He didn't know if Kraken had locked onto his position, so Quinn did what he felt right in the moment and kicked up the speed and darted forward, throwing zigzags every few meters. Quinn could hear the sounds of the stabbing of the ground by the tentacles. This told Quinn that Kraken had a vague idea of his location, but that piece of information wasn't favorable to Quinn, so he kept going, and finally Kraken's body. This was the first time in his months of starting his dives that Quinn had seen the Kraken's main body. It remarkably looked like a squid with an elongated tube-shaped body, large yellow eyes, skin that certainly didn't match a typical squid's skin. It had that hard and rough texture, unlike the squid's soft outer layer. There were so many tentacles coming out of the Kraken's body that Quinn couldn't tell how many did it have. One thing that Quinn did notice was it wasn't going serious against me. Even though Quinn couldn't count or even see the number of tentacle bases, he knew that there were far more than the Kraken had used on him. Kraken's eyes met with Quinn's, and at that moment, he studied Kraken's eyes. In those eyes, Quinn saw no hostility or anger of any kind. All he could discern in the holy yellow eyes was curiosity and interest towards Quinn. The Kraken saw in Quinn's eyes fascination, interest, and slight concern. The Kraken clearly had an idea of what the tiny human wanted. The tiny human child clearly wanted to get to the place that it was hiding. It knew that this human child knew of the place that it hid beneath its body. The Kraken knew of the vault because it knew everything about its home. The Kraken was the oldest of all living inside the Great Lake. The Kraken could be the apex predator if it wanted to be and wipe every being in the lake, but it didn't. All it wanted to do was to live its life peacefully. Even the colony of militant merpeople avoided the Kraken because of fear and respect. Decades ago, it had come through the waterway connecting the Great Lake to the ocean and ever since lived inside the lake. During its time here, it found about the place that he now guarded. The vault wasn't much to someone as great as itself, but to the little human children that came to the castle every year, it was dangerous. It had taken upon himself from getting humans inside there. It wanted to protect human children. So when this little child was clearly trying to get inside the dangerous place, it stopped the child twice. But here he was coming for the third time, and he had almost slipped away this time. The beast and the human stared at each other for a moment of peace and stillness before the game of cat and mouse started again as tentacles rose to catch Quinn, and Quinn took off with water magic. Quinn, who had gotten so close to the Kraken, looked for a gate or entrance of some kind. He had gotten so close and wasn't going to let this opportunity pass away. It doesn't matter if the Kraken likes it or not, but I am going in there, thought Quinn, as he dodged tentacles that seemed to increase in number and increasing the difficulty by another level. Where is it? Where is it? Quinn swam at top speeds around the Kraken, trying to find the vault and avoiding the tentacles at the same time when he came across a clearly carved design into the lake bed. Upon a closer look, Quinn was that it was some kind of tunnel partially blocked by the Kraken's tentacle. That is it! That must be it, smiled Quinn, and immediately shot towards it in an attempt to get inside. Yes, celebrated Quinn when he saw within touching distance of the tunnel. But then his body snapped to stop, and Quinn clearly felt something wrap around his leg and pull him back. The Kraken had got Quinn's legs with one of its tentacles. No, yelled Quinn into the water, but no voice came out. 
All he could do was see the tunnel getting distant from him as the kraken's tentacle pulled him away. On the lakeside, Quinn laid on the ground, watching the sky the afternoon sky. The kraken had dropped him on the shore immediately after his capture. Quinn had been caught inches away from the tunnel and dragged away from the prize he was seeking. For the third time, Quinn had been bested by the kraken. Both parties didn't want the other to get hurt and had taken the lethality out of their moves. And in that playing field, Quinn had been defeated thrice. Currently, Quinn was feeling a deep sense of failure. The goal line was in front of him, and he was about to reach it, but then he literally was thrown out of the race. The reason for that unusual sense of deep failure was because of the last year's events. Last year, Quinn had been taken over by the Sin Curse and Ta, Ken for a ride that he clearly didn't sign up for. Even though Quinn had come out stronger on the other side, but the truth was that the second vault had utterly defeated him without even giving Quinn a fighting chance. He was defeated before he even knew the fight had started. So to make up for that humiliating defeat, Quinn wanted to cruise through the third vault and show that the results of the last vault were not his top ability and that the icy vault wasn't a fluke. He wanted to crush the third vault without breaking a sweat. But even before entering the vault, Quinn had been thwarted thrice. No. A barely audible whisper escaped Quinn. Quinn got up from the ground and stood up straight, looking at the lake with a straight expression. But there was a fire in his eyes. Failure isn't the opposite of success, spat out Quinn with heat in his voice. He turned away from the lake and walked some steps away before turning back to face the lake and cracked his neck. It's a part of success. He ran towards the lake, and as he ran, gills appeared on his neck and sides of his chest. Quinn jumped into the lake, and the second his body was fully inside the water, he opened his eyes, and the water surrounding him heard the command of magic. A calm envelope of water formed around Quinn, but outside of that water envelope, the water roared with energy. With a single thought from Quinn, he shot forward with full speed towards the kraken. Not towards the kraken, thought Quinn. He wasn't going towards the Kraken. The Kraken is a stepping stone. I am going towards that tunnel. I am going towards success. Within a few minutes, Quinn reached the Kraken's tentacles, and instead of going straight for the tunnel, Quinn landed on the lake bed, closed his eyes, and raised his hands. Failure, he was feeling. Determination to get past the Kraken. Anger of failing to get past the Kraken thrice. Serenity he felt in the current moment as he focused on his magic. Resentment towards the Kraken, who blocked his path. Excitement of having his goal so close. Every emotion Quinn felt mixed together and touched his magic. The failure of the second vault wasn't a worthless experience. It was one of the most important events of Quinn's life. And right now, Quinn was going to use what he had learned in that failure. All sound vanished for Quinn as he opened his eyes and casted the magic. The Kraken, who had just sent the human child away, frowned when he felt the child return, and was about to once again throw him out of his house when it felt a tingle through the water. It felt magic, a lot of magic coursing through the water. The kraken could tell that the magic was from the human child, and the second that thought flashed through its mind, the kraken saw. The mighty beast of water watched as the water around its skin turned to ice, covering his body in ice. Within a blink of an eye, the front side of the kraken was covered in thick ice. The kraken was confused because it felt no pain or discomfort from the ice. All the ice did was cover his body. But then the kraken understood the reason for the ice, as the blanket of ice suddenly pushed against its body and dislodged its body from the lake floor, pushing him up to make him tumble. The tiny human child was pushing with ice so that he could get inside the dangerous place. It wasn't going to let him go in so easily. The kraken tried to break the ice, but another layer of ice would replace the cracked layer. No matter what the kraken tried, the ice reappeared thicker than before, and eventually he was pushed and tumbled over to his side, leaving the tunnel to the dangerous wide open. Quinn lowered his hands with a deep exhale of water before jumping with water magic his movements, and in one leap, he was beside the tunnel with the carvings around the edges of the entrance of the tunnel. 
He gave the fallen kraken one final look and saw that one of the tentacles had risen and was making its way towards Quinn. A smirk appeared on Quinn as he wev, ed the tentacle goodbye while jumping down the tunnel, leaving behind the fallen kraken. Quinn West, MC, channeling his inner young Magneto and finding that balance. Kraken, mighty beast of water, had a big fall. Web Novel has been shadow banning comments recently. This means that any comment that contains profanities in any form will be automatically deleted. So if you are commenting with curses and profanities, censor a single letter or get creative. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 88, Entering the Third Vault. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at ahitspeptreon.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor. The tunnel leading to the third vault was a long one. While falling through the tunnel, Quinn estimated that the depth was at least 30 meters. He could see light at the end of the tunnel, but the passage to that light was dark, making it hard for Quinn to see anything other than the end he was swimming towards. Thus, the second Quinn entered the tunnel, he lit up his surroundings to observe, not because he wanted to have some light, as he was half falling, half swimming, to increase his falling speed, but in case there was something of interest and importance on the tunnel's walls. The result he was able to glean at, as he passed the stone walls, was that the tunnel walls were smooth and clean. There were no signs of any markings or etchings that gave any information about what was to come. Quinn felt relieved and worried while swimming through the tunnel. He was relieved because there was no extra information that needed to be memorized a lie before, before exiting the tunnel. And he was worried because he was once again stepping into the unknown with no idea of what would come. He was sure that whatever came was related to water because it was what he had interpreted from Friar's riddle. So he ramped up the water magic around him and got himself ready as he closed in towards the light at the end. The thing at the end of the tunnel wasn't what he was expecting. Quinn was expecting there to be water when he exited the tunnel, but the reality was 180 degrees different. The moment his head exited the tunnel, his breathing hitched because there was no water outside the tunnel. He couldn't get any more water inside his body through his mouth. The second he came out of the tunnel, Quinn's pupils narrowed because of the sudden cut from an oxygen source. His respiratory system was magically transformed to work inside water, but that also meant that his natural respiratory system was reshaped and thus he couldn't exchange gases from the air. Quinn gasped for a solid two to three seconds before his mind caught up to what was happening prompting him to reverse all the transfigurations in his body and went back to his human respiratory system. The water from his lung cavity was immediately gathered up and vanished so that there wasn't any fluid buildup. And when everything was cleared, Quinn took deep breaths through his mouth to get the airflow going. The erratic gasping subsided and Quinn went back to breathing through his nose. Recovering from the sudden surprise, Quinn noticed something unnatural in his current position. His eyes widened when he saw that his arms were resting on the rim of the tunnel. I was swimming down, right? asked Quinn to himself. Quinn had swum into the tunnel down from the lake bed and expected to emerge from the other end, like falling down from a ceiling vent. But instead, he climbed up from a manhole in a road. He stretched his hand to push himself back and looked below, to see that he could still see the lake end of the tunnel. Okay, this is freaky and really interesting, commented Quinn. He then decided to get out of the tunnel. He placed his hands on the rim of the tunnel and pushed himself up out of the water. Standing on the edge of the tunnel, Quinn looked down, and even now he could see the other side of the tunnel that opened up in the Great Lake. Quinn just needed to jump in the tunnel and sink or swim down to come out of the lake bed of the Great Lake. How did they do this? remarked Quinn, looking at the dull stone cave, briefly looking for signs. This cave is upside down. So cool. Did gravity somehow switch without me knowing? 
Water does mess up with gravity perception, holding his chin with his hand, Quinn speculated. Or is the tunnel some kind of portal, and I am in a separate dimension? Ho ho, I will need to see what this is all about. Quinn wasn't planning to research further this topic before completing the vault, because if the tunnel was indeed a portal, then messing with it could end up damaging the portal, and in turn, destroying the only known way to the third vault. After admiring the magical phenomenon, Quinn roamed his eyes all over the cave. Starting from the tunnel, Quinn noticed that not a single drop of water from the tunnel made its way into the stone cave itself. The tunnel was filled with water to the brim, but not a single drop had splashed into the cave after Quinn had pulled himself into the stone cave. There is some kind of anti-water ward in here, observed Quinn as he looked at the dry cave floor and then looked down at his body. Not a single drop of water could be seen on Quinn's body. Combing a hand through his hair told him that even his hair was dry as if he had never swum his way into the cave. Yup, a version of anti-water ward, confirmed Quinn as he examined the credibility of his speculation by dunking his hand into the tunnel and pulling it back to see that not a single drop of water had made its way into the cave on his hand. Does it mean I can't sweat in here, or do the hydrophobic properties only extend to the lake water? Scanning the other parts of the cave, Quinn looked up and examined the light source that illuminated the entire stone cave. It was a load of crystal sticking out of the roof, scattering soft water blue light all around the stone cave a natural luminescent mineral crystal, and a blue one at that. Blue ones are so rare, slightly gasped Quinn. He had seen luminescent mineral crystals in his travels, but had never seen the particular shade of blue like the one he was looking at right now. The luminescent mineral crystal could be replicated with alchemy. But, because the alchemists were rare, artificial crystals weren't widely available. The people who hired alchemists didn't ask for glowing crystals when they could have an alchemist produce other, more significant things. Maybe I could make some of them for the living hall, murmured Quinn, thinking about how the living hall would look like in the light of a luminescent mineral crystal. Nah, I should make runic lights for the entire manor. At least that way, they could be turned off when not needed. Strolling away from the tunnel, Quinn wandered towards the part of the cave that had a room-wide, three-step short staircase. The stone steps on the floor acted as a divider inside the cave. The cave before the steps was like any stone cave you could find in the wild, but the area after the steps was definitely man-made. Instead of the rough walls and ceiling of the first part of the cave, the second part of the cave had no partition between the walls and ceiling. All the surface part floors were melded together to form a dome, and at the furthest end of the dome, there was a triangular opening in the dome wall. Similar to the tunnel, it too was filled entirely with water, and just like the tunnel, there wasn't a drop of water spilled out of the triangular opening, despite the triangular opening standing vertically to the floor. Slowly descending the short steps, Quinn came across some movement because of the triangular entrance. The second Quinn stepped down for the last time, the stone sunk at some places to form engraved words in the wall. Large engraved words formed above the entrance to form the words, Poseidon's wrath. Words appeared on the left side of the entrance. Beware, challenger. Enter the entrance, and you shall feel the wrath of God. This is not for the soft-hearted and weak. Think before entering, because God's fury doesn't have eyes. Another set of words appeared on the right side of the wall that said, The trials are long and arduous. To understand the law, you, brave challenger, will need some aid. Wish it upon the water, and you will return to the safety, away from peril. Fluidly an orb of water came out of the water inside the Tryon, Guler entrance, and gently floated towards Quinn. It stopped a short distance away from him. The orb of water emitted faint magic, Quinn noticed that the words were on the right side of the wall. In addition, he could tell that this orb of water was the aid he was told that he'd have in the words engraved on the right side of the wall. He walked around the water orb, observing it, and carefully casting some magic to see what kind of magic was used inside the water. After some deliberation and internal debate, Quinn confirmed that the water orb wasn't harmful to him. 
No harm in giving it some help, shrugged Quinn as he stepped closer to the orb and gracefully lifted his right hand towards the water orb and gently touched the water orb with his index finger. The water orb shone faint blue before the water rippled and went inside Quinn through his finger. Whoa, hey, whoa, flippin' hell, exclaimed Quinn as he watched the water get sucked into his body, followed by a brief spike of light on his inner forearm. In a surprise, Quinn withdrew his hand and turned it over to see that his previously unmarked forearm now had a navy blue symbol on it. Quinn could feel that if he channeled magic into the emblem on his skin, it would trigger whatever magic present in the water that went inside Quinn's body. Not cool. I hope this isn't permanent, sighed Quinn as he rubbed his marked skin. This design isn't what I want my first tattoo to be. Hell, I don't even want a tattoo, exclaimed Quinn while shaking his head. Quinn closed his eyes while heavily exhaling, but when he opened them, Quinn had changed to a focused expression as he stared at the triangular entrance filled with water. Let's do this. He walked to the triangular opening, held his breath, closed his eyes, and dived into the water without hesitation, feeling the lukewarm water against his skin, which was much warmer than the cold Great Lake, Quinn primed his magic to change his body through transfiguration. After submerging his entire body, Quinn opened his eyes and noticed that the water was cleaner than the lake water, and, because of that, he could see better in that water. Quinn was about to transfigure his body to add the underwater respiratory system with transfiguration when he felt the familiar feeling that he had felt many times in his life, especially during this past summer break. There was a tug on his entire body and the momentary lack of sensory input. He had felt the similar tug at least twice every day while he went back and forth between the West Manor and Cape Dung Gym. I'm being teleported, thought Quinn, and just then, he re-emerged into a completely different place. He didn't appear in the water anymore, but somewhere he was least expecting to be. A wide-eyed Quinn stared down from a height of five meters down a humongous raging whirlpool. Watching the gigantic sinkhole sucking and spitting out water, something that was formed because of opposing forces meeting each other to create a chaotic maelstrom, a fierce force of nature. Oh shit, yelled Quinn as he fell. The five-meter fall went very quickly. Between the shock of being teleported and the stunning surprise at seeing that monstrous water vortex, Quinn didn't have time or the initiative to make any magic work. Splashing heavily, Quinn entered the turbulent water and was immediately swept into the stormy waves. The strong waves blasted against Quinn's entire body as he quickly was pulled deeper into the brutal maelstrom. For a full ten seconds, that became the longest ten seconds of Quinn's life, as his entire body was being pulled apart from all directions by the might from the revolving water waves. It took him ten seconds, an amount of time that was a critical time inside these conditions to get his mind back on track to difficulty pulling his body into a fetal position. Every ounce of water magic he knew was used to barely being able to pull himself together and attain a position with minimal surface area for the whirlpool water to work on. He had gone from using wall to magic to swimming in calm water to using it to decrease his injury chances. With his eyes closed, Quinn concentrated his magic to transfigure himself a gill system. He already had water inside his body because of the suddenness of his, of his fall, which caused Quinn to swallow a lot of water that went straight to his lungs. Transfiguring with water continuously slamming into his body was difficult, and he even failed once before he was able to get the aquatic respiratory system working. But the situation gave him another twist when water entered his body through the gill flaps, and the second Quinn felt it, he pulled the plug. The turbulent water could critically damage his insides if he didn't leave now. He channeled magic into the insignia on his arm, and it glowed for a split second before Quinn disappeared from the whirlpool. The water inside the triangle entrance rippled for a second before Quinn came out with a calm water sphere surrounding him. The water sphere floated a distance from the entrance before gently setting Quinn on the ground, before vanishing like it was never there. For a few seconds, Quinn laid on the floor, showing no movements except for the furrowed before his chest throbbed, and he coughed out some water inside his body 
that was promptly vanished by the cave ward the second it came outside Quinn's body. Quinn rolled over and his elbow to lift his chest up and used his other hand to pound his chest while coughing. He had just vanished the backlog of water that was not expelled from the previous cough. He collapsed back on the floor, rolled over to his back, and took deep breaths through his mouth as his chest heaved up and down. There was no cursing externally or internally as Quinn regained his mental facilities and showed it by lifting his right arm to observe it. The mark is gone, noticed Quinn, entering full analysis mode. One-time usage, thought Quinn, and then raised his head to see in the entrance's direction and saw another water orb floating there as if waiting for Quinn to touch it and take its place in his arm. A portkey type of magic? At least something similar with additional magic, theorized Quinn, thinking back to his experience. I went from turbulent water to the calm water at the entrance. I was definitely teleported and then brought out here. He sat up and stared past the water orb at the triangular entrance. Quinn couldn't see anything inside, but the words Poseidon's wrath were staring him in the eye, telling him that the entrance was the gate to the chaotic waters. Quinn got up and started pacing back and forth under the dome-shaped part of the cave. A big-ass maelstrom. That wasn't natural. Not at all, dismissed Quinn with a shake of his head. Natural water whirlpools aren't that powerful. That was definitely maintained deliberately to perform with that level of rotational force. I barely have any information. Was it a real place on Earth, or was it an expanded dimension? I couldn't see the sky, or else I would have known. Quinn clicked his tongue because of the extremity of the conditions and the short time he had spent inside. If it was an expanded dimension, Quinn's guess between a place on Earth or a magically created dimension was the latter. Then how big was the place? Is there a limit to the depth? Would I have reached depth if I had stayed in there? There were a lot of questions related to the properties of the magical maelstrom in his mind. But the biggest question in his mind was, what do I have to accomplish in there? What's the goal? The end line? Quinn sighed as he stretched his body and felt the dull ache erupting in his limbs and joints. Ar, I took some beating in there, groaned Quinn. His chest, back, and limbs hurt from being pulled apart inside the whirlpool. I need to fix that before tomorrow. The injuries weren't serious and he could fix them in a jiffy, but he wasn't looking forward to getting this beat up every day. Just need to get better at water magic to make myself comf audible there. Oh gosh, look at me. My first thought is to get comfortable instead of avoiding that. How far I have come, smiled Quinn, completely oblivious that he was on the empath. Baby steps, sighed Quinn and looked at the words etched in the stone walls. Even though the first attempt was a total failure, Quinn had a smile on his face because it was a start. Quinn West, MC, Whirlpool, Whirlpool. Does any get this reference? It is a TV jingle. Web Novel has been shadow banning comments recently. This means that any comment that contains profanities in any form will be automatically deleted. So if you are commenting with curses and profanities, censor a single letter or get creative. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 89. Kraken's Approval and New Exercise Partner. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my patreon.com slash fiction only reader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan. After healing himself off the dull ache in his body, Quinn decided to leave the vault for the day. He felt saturated from the day's work between dodging the Kraken to get inside, the vault, and swirling inside the maelstrom, Quinn felt that he had his fill of adventure and action for today. Quinn walked to the tunnel and peered down into the water and saw the lake end opening. He made a face between annoyance and fatigue and sighed, I don't want to fight the Kraken. Not right now. He looked back around at the stone cave and wondered, Should I take a short nap in here before I go back? Nah. Let's just get this over with. The Kraken will just throw me out, which is what I want now, grumbled Quinn. He squatted down and slipped down into the tunnel, head first. While swimming inside the tunnel,
Quinn tried to feel the magic behind the tunnel, but it escaped his natural senses. He had no idea how the switch from up and down was done. I would need to actively try to cast magic to see what is behind the cover, thought Quinn as he came up from the tunnel. The first thing that he saw when he exited the tunnel were big, solid yellow eyes staring down at him intently. Whoa! exclaimed Quinn, and even though no sound came out, Quinn gulped in a fresh batch of lake water. The Kraken's tentacles immediately surrounded him. Unlike their previous encounters, the tentacles didn't coil around Quinn, but instead, one of the tentacles came near Quinn and poked him with its tip. The tentacle's tip was so large that it pushed against almost half of his entire body, pushing him to the ground. Quinn, who fell to the lake bed, looked up at the Kraken, who kept staring at him with big yellow eyes. Then, at that moment, he finally realized how enormous the Kraken really was. In the past, the biggest thing Quinn had seen was a mountain troll, but the Kraken was on another level. What? What does it want? thought Quinn, as he stared back at the Kraken. Does it want to eat me? I'm tired, but bring it on. He revved up his magic and readied for another bout. Quinn hoped for the Kraken to give him a ride to the shore. But if it wanted to fight, Quinn was going to give it one. It turned out that Kraken didn't want to fight because it withdrew its, enor its enormous body and assumed a comfortable position. One tentacle wrapped around the tunnel entrance, forming a coiled wall around the tunnel entrance, but didn't block it from above. Ha! Huh. What? wondered Quinn bewilderedly. He had no idea why the Kraken backed off after some staring and a poke. Quinn didn't know that the reason the Kraken had stared him down was because it was checking if Quinn was all right. It wanted to check if Quinn happened to be fine after going inside the dangerous place. After it confirmed that Quinn was uninjured, it backed off and went back to his chill lake life. The Kraken didn't block the entrance as a show of his intentions, it was going to continue to guard the dangerous place in case another tiny human came looking. But if Quinn wanted to go in, he could go in, because as far as the Kraken was concerned, Quinn had made it back alive after going in. So he probably would be fine if Quinn went in again. Plus, the Kraken was prideful and considered Quinn to be capable. Quinn had successfully made the Kraken move, and that in the Kraken's eyes was a sign of strength. As far as the Kraken was concerned, Quinn was strong and could handle himself. Quinn stared at the Kraken for a while before swimming away, still not knowing the reason behind the Kraken's actions. Why are you here again? asked Quinn, stretching his body for his morning run and workout. Quinn looked to Eddie as both stood at the starting point of Quinn's daily run route. Yesterday after die, Nunner, Eddie had informed Quinn that he would like to join him for his morning exercises. Quinn, who had been lost in thought, thinking about the third vault, had heard Eddie's words and had absent-mindedly nodded and hadn't asked for the reason. About that. The Quidditch tryouts are in two months, and I was thinking about joining the team, spoke Eddie as he awkwardly tried to copy Quinn's stretching movements. I want to pass the tryouts so that I can make the bench this year and then play on the field next year. Eddie knew that Quinn went for a run every morning and decided to follow him to get fit for the coming tryouts so that he could have an extra edge. I see. Quidditch, huh? I know you followed the sport, but never knew that you wanted to play for the team, asked Quinn. He was happy that Eddie decided to do exercise to get fit. I wasn't planning on joining the team before, but I decided to give it a try this year. It would be fun to play Quidditch for the house. Everybody would be looking while I play, replied Eddie, a bright smile on his face. So what you mean to say is that you want to play so that you can get popular and get a girlfriend, said Quinn, reading between the lines and finding out the real reason behind his friend's sudden interest in playing Quidditch. Eddie unabashedly put a hand over Quinn's shoulder and gave him a lopsided grin. You know me so well, no wonder we are so close. Quinn shook his head with a small smile before asking, But are you sure you want to join the team? We have the OBLs next year, you know? Will you be able to balance Quidditch and studies? I'll be fine. If I see my grades slipping, I'll have you tutor me. With you helping me out, I'll probably do better than I do now. Responded Eddie and gave Quinn a thumbs up as if saying thank you in advance. 
I'll help you out if you need it, but I'm going to only help you out with the practical side. I'm not good at explaining the theory, said Quinn, agreeing to help his friend. Eddie gave Quinn a silent stare before speaking. So what you are implying is that you get frustrated when we don't understand things after you explain them once. In times like those, you probably think of us as monkeys, don't you? This time Quinn put his hand on Eddie's shoulder, beamed and unabashedly spoke. You're right, we're close. Come on, give me a hug. But Eddie pushed Quinn away with a F you, stay away face. All right, let's get started, said Quinn with a clap. I usually run before doing push-ups, squats, and crunches. I finish by skipping rope. He pointed at Eddie and advised, You should run a kilometer today and increase the length as you progress. Aim for a comfortable three kilometers before the tryouts. I would suggest that you focus more on your upper body because there are a lot of upper body movements while being on a broom, so I'd advise sit-ups, push-ups, and pull-ups. Later on, we can add planks and leg raises. Also, what position are you planning to play asked Quinn after he was done suggesting an exercise plan? Chaser, replied Eddie. Great, now, I would suggest that you run at your pace. Don't try a full-on sprint. If you sprint, you'll build up fatigue quicker, and that won't do you any good, warned Quinn. Afterward, he told Eddie how much he needed to run to complete a kilometer. He then slapped Eddie on his back and ran away. Quinn still ran a five-kilometer route every day. He hadn't tried to increase the distance because he did more things now, so he just tried to reduce his time and had been slowly getting faster with time. He usually ran a route that would be exactly five kilometers when he returned to the starting line. But today, Quinn decided to run a route that would have him pass nearby where Eddie was running so that Quinn could see how he was doing. When Quinn came around the first time, he saw Eddie standing with his hands on his knees, so he raised his voice and called out to Eddie. Eddie, don't stop. If you can't run, walk. Just don't stop. Eddie looked up and saw Quinn waving at him as he ran a distance away from him. He groaned and started running because he was embarrassed that Quinn had seen him stop. When Quinn returned from completing his run, he saw Eddie sitting on the ground, pulling away at the grass. Are you done? asked Quinn. He hadn't chosen to run Eddie's route five times because he was sure that Eddie would try to keep up with him, despite his warning. And as much as fun it would have been to say, on your left, as he passed him by, Quinn wanted Eddie to relax and have a positive first day. He would return the next day and keep up till the tryouts and after. Eddie looked up and nodded as he stood up. Yeah, what's next? You will start with push-ups, instructed Quinn before asking, can you do a couple of push-ups, or are you a complete beginner? I can do five, replied Eddie, looking offended that Quinn would even think that he was a complete beginner who couldn't do one push-up. Don't give me that face. I was just asking a question, grinned Quinn before continuing. Do three sets of five, keep your back straight and properly go down. I don't want to see sloppy push-ups. Eddie nodded and asked, what are you going to do? I'll be doing burpees. They are basically the combination of a squat, kickback feet to get into a push-up stance, high plank positions, a push-up, return to a squatting position, stand, and end with a jump. Quinn showed Eddie how to execute a burpee before both of them started to do their stuff. Eddie did his three sets of five, while Quinn did his three sets of twelve. At first, Quinn hated burpees because they were tough, but as time went on, they got easier to execute and complete, but that wasn't why he stopped hating them. The results of the burpees made him like doing burpees. After he was half a month in, doing burpees every day, Quinn noticed that his running had improved. He started running faster without consciously ramping up my speed. His lungs felt clear, and he found in him coasting through the miles. A month after adding burpees into his routine, Quinn felt that his strides felt stronger and felt that his breathing was more composed than at the start of the month. To Quinn, who ran every day, seeing noticeable improvement was enough for him to keep doing burpees. Quinn was done with two sets of twelve when Eddie called to him, Hey, I'm done. What do I have to do next? Quinn laid down on the ground, completely flat on his back, with his legs bent at knees with feet planted firmly on the ground, about shoulder-width apart. I want you to raise your head and shoulders from the floor 
and feel your abdominal muscles contract. You don't have to fully sit up. Just lift enough till you feel your abdominal muscles contract, instructed Quinn as he showed Eddie how to do a crunch. Try to avoid pulling your head forward, as it may strain your neck. Lower your head and shoulders back towards your starting position. Remember to exhale as you raise your head and shoulders, then inhale as you lower them. Getting up from the ground, Quinn explained, that is called a crunch. It will target your abs, and if you maybe work really hard and eat right, run a lot, you might show some abs later. Do you have abs? Asked Eddie, looking down at Quinn's stomach area. Quinn raised his shirt and showed Eddie his stomach. He had a four-pack, but they were faint and not toned enough to see sharp squares and lack definition. But Quinn did have visible oblique abs on his side and a faint V-cut near on his lower waist from practicing Muay Thai every day in the evening. Holy shit! When did you get those? Exclaimed Eddie as he stared at Quinn's abs before looking up and suggesting. How about we find a way for you to walk around shirtless? That way, you can showcase the goods, and I can take advantage of the pact when you get a girlfriend. Quinn stared at his friend and thought about how much Eddie had been thinking about getting a girlfriend. He could see gears turning inside Eddie's head, probably thinking about how to use him to get a girlfriend. What if I don't get a girlfriend? asked Quinn, a bit interested in the answer that Eddie would give him. Even if you don't get a girlfriend, there is an excellent near 100% chance that a lot of girls would flirt with you, said Eddie as he crossed his hands and smiled. Like a moth to a flame, they will gather around you and I will be standing there with my net of charisma to trap them under my spell. Quinn blinked a couple of times before speaking. Cool, 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 but I'd really suggest you change the terminology. No, how about we don't talk about this ever again? Yeah, that would be good for both of us. Huh. Sure, whatever. Let me think more about this plan, said Eddie distractedly, thinking about how to exploit Quinn for his future dating life. Ever since Quinn had known Eddie, his friend took action when he got motivated to accomplish something. Last year, Eddie had gotten the news that his family cat, which had been with his family before Eddie was born, had died because of old age. The cat had been very close to Eddie, and he hadn't taken the news well. Eddie had gone into a mourning state for a while after he had gotten the news. During that time, there had been an older Ravenclaw student who was a dickhead and major a-hole. When he found out that Eddie's cat had died, he decided to grace Eddie with his awful presence. Every time the bully had a chance, he would sit near Eddie and loudly talk about how funny it was that Eddie's cat had died. The older bully would regularly corner Eddie when he was alone and urged him to cry. Are you going to cry? Are you going to cry about it? Like a big baby? Big baby cry over your stupid cat? Everyone's going to see you cry. You're about to cry, aren't you? And more similar things. At that time, Quinn, who was under the influence of the sin curse, had wanted to rip the bully apart so much that it would haunt him for a lifetime. Eddie had stopped Quinn from brutalizing the dipshit and had shaken his head with a resolute face while clutching Quinn's arm. Eddie's refusal had been firm enough for then Quinn to back off. But after a month, Eddie had approached Quinn and had asked for his help to teach the older Ravenclaw shit stain a lesson. I was grieving for my cat. Now I'm done and I'm feeling angry. Plus, I didn't want you to do something without me was what Eddie had replied when Quinn had asked about the sudden change in heart. The piece of shit had tried to make Eddie cry, so Eddie decided to turn it the other way. I've found this potion recipe that will make a person cry, has spoken Eddie as he dropped a heavy tome in front of Quinn. I can't brew this, but I think you can, so brew this for me. That guy wants to see me crying, but I will be the one who's going to see him crying. Quinn still recalled how he had given a smirk that had promised humiliation. He had spent many hours on that project. He had improved the recipe to make it more potent and last longer. After Quinn finished, the recipe he had devised would induce someone to cry like a baby, snot with a constantly runny nose, and make them sweat heavily. Eddie had taken the new potion and had slipped it to the target, sat back, and saw the show unfold. The shithead took the potion, and it took maybe an hour before the crying started. 
Eddie had slipped in the potion during breakfast, so the crying started during a class. McGonagall had to send the crying boy with a runny nose so bad that his handkerchief and sleeves were dripping wet to the hospital wing to get him fixed. Madame Pomfrey had tried to give the snot baby a counter potion that she had concocted, but Quinn's potion was a modified recipe that had taken the counter potion for the original recipe into account. The counter potion failed, and the bully was told to stay in the hospital wing until she could brew a flushing potion that would flush out every potion inside the body. When Eddie got the news that the potion had worked, he went with Quinn to the hospital wing. Quinn made Sue re that Madame Pomfrey was away and gave Eddie the nod. Eddie had taken one of his potion gloves with him, so when they reached the hospital wing, Eddie was wearing the glove. He then walked to the boy who had made the grieving process so much harder. Hey, dipshit, you wanted to see me crying, satisfied now? said Eddie as he stood by the bedside. The still-crying Ravenclaw's eyes widened when he realized that Eddie was the one who had caused what he was going through right now. You... He tried to speak up, but Eddie tightly clutched his face with his gloved hand, cutting him off. Everybody saw you, bawling like a baby, and I'm going to spread that you're a crybaby and make sure it sticks, so even when you graduate from Hogwarts, people will still remember your new nickname threatened Eddie with a scathing tone. If you don't want things to get worse, stay away from me, don't talk to me, don't even look at me. If I'm walking towards you, turn the other way round. I don't want to see your ugly mug ever again. Eddie jerked his hand from his face and wiped it off on the stunned bully's hair before adding. It seems Madame Pomfrey doesn't have the counter potion. It takes three days to brew a flushing potion, so get ready to face the snot fest for three days because you aren't going anywhere else, he smirked and added one last bit. When someone drinks a flushing potion, the person goes through hours of vomiting and violent diarrhea. I'm sure you'll enjoy the experience. Good luck. Eddie turned back and walked out of the hospital wing without turning around. Quinn, who was still standing inside the hospital wing, waited until Eddie was out to take a picture of the boy in the bed from a borrowed camera the second the subject looked his way. After clicking the photo, Quinn spoke with gestures, talk, and this goes out to everyone. He gave a wide smile with a wave before exiting the hospital wing. Eddie, who was coming back to the real world after thinking about exploiting Quinn to get himself a girlfriend, noticed a smile on Quinn's face. Why are you smiling? Quinn looked at Eddie with the smile still on his face and replied, I was remembering the crybaby incident. That day at the hospital wing was fun. Eddie's eyes shined in remembrance. He nodded with a small smile. Yeah, that was a fun day. I was so cool that day. Quinn nodded before jutting his chin towards the ground and said, Enough chit-chat. Drop and give me three sets of ten. I'm worried about you. I'll make you work hard and sweat away all that pent-up horny energy you have inside you. You don't have to say it like that, complained Eddie, causing Quinn to laugh. The two buddies continued to have fun first thing in the morning. Quinn West, MC, Mad Scientist, school version. Eddie Carmichael, horny adolescent, don't make fun of my cat. Kraken, self-appointed guard, tiny human will be fine. Web novel has been shadow banning, comments recently. This means that any comment that contains profanities in any form will be automatically deleted. So, if you are commenting with curses and profanities, censor a single letter or get creative. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 90. Baby Steps Against the Whirlpool. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at thpnone.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor. Quinn sighed as he rubbed the insignia from the third vault safety mechanism. He really wanted to know how this tattoo could teleport the bearer. Assuming that no person was casting a port key or a similar spell, then there was an enchantment that could produce teleportation magic without human or any magical species' help. Both the first and this vault had complex runic and warding magic, noted Quinn, as he looked into the triangular entrance to the whirlpool. 
just how much planning and execution went to creating the vaults. The people who created them must have given all of it a lot of thought when creating them. Quinn still usually went inside the first vault to do research and learn more about the mechanism. He would collect the energy from Absolute Zero for his engraver and make observations for an upcoming project that he was working on. But all the time, including last year, when Quinn had become greedy towards a lot of things, and one of them was Absolute Zero. He had tried hard to figure out a way to get the Absolute Zero out of the vault. But Quinn still didn't know a way to create a portable containment system that would allow him to carry the Absolute Zero without dead-freezing everything around and causing a long-term climate change that would plunge Hogwarts into an ice age for decades to come. Whoever built the first vault knew what they were doing. The builder had used the energy from the Absolute Zero to trap itself. A self-sustained system that wouldn't degrade as long as the prisoner itself stayed strong. It was clear that the builder who had made the rune cluster knew how Absolute Zero worked because without an understanding of the alchemic material that was being contained, without the proper knowledge of the power source and runes, the containment arrangement would have collapsed a long time ago because of the corrosive, cold energy from Absolute Zero. Standing inside the third vault, Quinn went into thinking about the first vault, the icy vault, for several minutes before taking a sharp breath and shaking his head. Not the right time or place, Quinn, berated Quinn himself, looked at the ceiling of the cave and said, sorry about that. Quinn talked to the third vault as if it was a girl, apologizing because he was thinking about another girl while on a date. Let's effin go, said Quinn to hype himself as he looked at the triangular entrance. Quinn loosened his body, wriggled his arms and legs, and made sure he was ready before running towards the triangular water-filled entrance where was Poseidon's wrath. He felt the water cover his body, immediately followed by a tug on his body, and with a ripple in the water, Quinn was gone. After a momentary loss of his sensation, Quinn's senses returned. His eyes showed him the raging water, his ears made him hear the loud and continuous splashes of water. He could feel the moisture in the air against his skin, his sense of smell detected the heavy scent of water. Finally, even his tongue sent a signal of a nearby presence of water. This time, though, Quinn wasn't surprised and was ready for the sudden teleportation. He turned upside down, away from the water, faced upwards, and immediately used one of the spells he had come to look forward to. The second the magic triggered, Quinn stopped dead in the air. The charm slowed his body's velocity to zero, to the point he was no longer falling and stayed in a spot in the air. Arresto Momentum was a fascinating spell that was capable of slowing the velocity of the target. If used properly, it could also stop the target completely. Of course, there were limitations to the Arresto Momentum spell. First, the difficulty of slowing down objects was directly proportional to the initial velocity of the object. The F, stir the speed of the target, the more magic and skill from the user it would take to slow down the target. Factors like mass, surface area, and acceleration of the target all added to the spell's difficulty. For example, an object dropping at its terminal speed would be much tougher to slow down than an object thrown from the top of a short building. Second, if an object was brought to a complete stop, it would get harder to keep it stationary if the object moves while it's held stationary with magic. Any external force that wasn't in work before the complete stop would be against the nature of the magic and would break the spell after certain limits. If Quinn wriggled his body in the situation he was currently in, he would break the spell and he would continue to fall. A turn of the head, curl of his wrist, or anything minor wouldn't threaten to break the spell. Anything greater than some minor movements would exponentially increase the difficulty of keeping himself stationary in the air. So Quinn had to make sure he didn't make any excessive movements. As such, he first turned his backside to the vortex so that his front body would be facing upwards. Quinn could have used the levitation spell, Wingardium Leviosa, on his clothes to anchor himself in the air, just like the creator, Jarleth Hobart, had done in the first public use of the charm, even though at that time Hobart himself didn't understand what he had created. 
Nonetheless, that wasn't possible because Quinn only had a pair of trunks on him, and those weren't enough to anchor himself in the air. Well, I could have transfigured clothes to provide more support, considered Quinn before lightly shrugging. Whatever, I like this spell better. Quinn looked up above and smiled because his conjecture was correct. I knew I was right. This is an expanded dimension, chuckled Quinn, watching the pure white ceiling and walls of the place he was currently in. The white walls were telltale signs that this was a created dimension like the one in his suitcase. Okay, you can do it. No pressure, reassured Quinn as he took in several deep breaths before taking an extra deep breath and stored it inside his lungs and eked out without breathing out. Here I come. The magic stopping his fall disappeared, and Quinn began falling. In the short few seconds of his fall, Quinn crossed his hands over his chest and made sure that he would enter the whirlpool feet first. Quinn entered the water vortex with a loud splash and immediately sank inside the raging water. Inside the water, Quinn held his breath as he allowed the turbulent flow to pull him. He kept his body flat as a board and seized his body straight in order to not get hurt from the water. He hadn't transfigured the gill respiratory system that allowed him to breathe underwater because it didn't work inside chaotic water. Even while in the Great Lake, Quinn maintained a calm water envelope to allow a stable water flow because he used water magic to push himself to speeds greater than any aquatic species he knew. Plus, the bubblehead charm was also completely out of the race because it was too fragile and would pop the second Quinn entered the raging water. So why was Quinn diving inside the most dangerous waters he had experienced without proper breathing measures? Well, the motive of this dive was to observe the conditions inside the water so he could gather some data. Last time, the sudden teleportation had taken Quinn by surprise, so he didn't get a clear read on the conditions. But this time, he was ready and was getting a feel of the current with his body. Quinn had made a plan to get his transfigured gill respiratory system work in his current conditions, but he needed physical data to verify if his method would work. The flow of the water inside the maelstrom was rough, and the last time, Quinn had experienced water entering his body through the gill side. This wasn't suitable because the water was supposed to enter through his mouth and gently flow over the gill leaves before exiting through the gill. L flaps. Water entering through his gills with speed could injure his lungs and cause complications that Quinn didn't want to deal with. So before implementing the changes that would allow him to breathe in his current conditions, Quinn needed the physical data that would roughly show that his idea would work. Hence, for three minutes, which was his limit for holding his breath, Quinn, with his eyes closed, focused all his attention on his body, feeling the water current, carefully and consciously perceiving the water velocity. When Quinn felt he couldn't hold his breath any longer, he sent magic to the insignia, and at a certain point, he felt the tug of teleportation. Right after, Quinn disappeared from inside the water. With a ripple in the water inside the triangular entrance, Quinn came out with water surrounding him as it laid him on the floor before disappearing without a trace. Quinn opened his eyes and immediately took long breaths of air. He laid on the floor for half a minute before sitting up and saying, Okay, that was good. He got up and started to pace around the room, a look of deep thought evident on his face. Quinn had got the physical data he was looking for, and the results he observed looked positive. Now he just needed to do some calculations and make some decisions before he could get started. All right, I need to increase the thickness. The flow was on the higher end of my safe zone, muttered Quinn and did more calculations in his head. Do I need to have them inside or outside? Nope, not inside. The gills have nerves, and I'll definitely feel pain. Yup, yup, yup. Definitely on the outside. Hmm, I will need to eject water as usual, but it will take more effort this time around groaned Quinn with a sigh. If only the gillyweed potion didn't have side effects on repeated consumption. Gillyweed was a magical plant that, when eaten, allowed a human to breathe underwater. It was said to resemble a bundle of slimy, gray-green rat tails. When eaten, it gave the consumer gills, allowing them to breathe underwater and webbing between the fingers and toes, allowing them to swim underwater with ease. 
Then, there was the gillyweed potion, which would enhance the effects of the original plant. The gillyweed, when brewed into a potion, would increase the efficiency of the plant by multiple times and would allow the consumer to breathe underwater for a few hours, in the same amount of gillyweed that would only allow one hour of underwater breathing. The advantage of consuming gillyweed was that the respiratory system, given by the plant, was automatic. Quinn had taken the potion while traveling around the world, and at that time, he only had needed to gulp in water, and his work was done. The muscles given by the magical plant took care of everything. Quinn's system was entirely manual, and he needed to direct the water into his lungs and then eject it through the gill openings using water magic. If Quinn wanted the automatic system, then he would either have to research aquatic creatures in more depth than he had done, or he would need to transfigure his body into an aquatic species as Victor Crum did. Quinn didn't think that doing more research was worth the returns, and changing himself into another animal wasn't something Quinn was thrilled about. But there were the side effects of consuming raw gillyweed or the gillyweed potion when taken regularly. The side effects included developing fish-like features, pale and oily skin, webbing between fingers and toes, and the worst, fishy breath, and similarly, fishy body odor. From the second Quinn confirmed that the third vault was going underwater, he knew gillyweed wouldn't be in his plan. Quinn knew he was going to spend a lot of time in the water. There was no way he was going to keep consuming gillyweed every time he went into the water. Okay, I'm done, declared Quinn, raised both his hands above his head and closed his for a few seconds before opening them. Come on, you can do it. Quinn channeled his magic throw, ugh, his body, and the muscles under the skin of his neck and chest wriggled violently before his skin split apart and grew into gill flaps. From the outside, there was nothing different from before, but Quinn could feel the changes inside. He immediately walked towards the triangular entrance and touched the safety water orb. The orb got sucked in, and once again, Quinn had the royal blue teleportation insignia on his arm. As Quinn's upper body immersed in the water, he felt the breath of life return to him. He gulped in more water. All right, it's working in calm water, affirmed Quinn as he flexed his gill muscles and felt the new addition working on his commands. Let's hope it will work in the vortex. Quinn teleported with a ripple in the water and a tug on his body. The second the water teleported him into the air, Quinn conjured a pair of swimming goggles over his eyes and crossed his arms over his chest. Quinn said out loud his last words before plunging into the water. Let's go. The water swept him away, and with a prayer to the water gods, Quinn took a couple of big gulps of water into his body. He felt the water travel through his body. Some water diverged to his neck gills while the majority went to his lungs. Quinn patiently waited for the water to cover the gills and spread over the blood vessels inside the gill leaves. The oxygen moved from the oxygen-rich water to the oxygen-deficient blood inside the blood vessels. Now came the main event, the climax of Quinn's motive today. The problem with his respiratory system was that the turbulent water would rush into his restructured lungs through the gill openings. Thus, in order to fix that problem, Quinn turned to biology to find a solution. And Quinn didn't have to travel far because the answer was inside the human body all along. The human heart consisted of four chambers, two upper chambers and two lower chambers. There was a valve through which blood passed before leaving each heart chamber. These valves prevented blood from flowing backwards. These valves were actual flaps located on each end of the two lower heart chambers. They acted as one-way inlets of blood on one side of a ventricle and one-way outlets of blood on the other side of a ventricle. As the heart muscle contracted and relaxed, the valves opened and shut, letting blood flow into the lower chamber and upper chamber at alternate times. Quinn realized that his water problem was somehow similar to how the water rushed from the wrong direction. He needed to stop that backflow, so he decided to copy the heart valve system. Quinn increased, first of all, the size of the valves and made them more sturdy than the heart valves because the pressure of water from the undertow was much higher than the pressure created by a human heart. He devised a layer in these valves that would sit under the gill flaps and above the actual gill leaves 
that held the blood vessels. So after the water was done with the gas exchange, Quinn would guide it towards the valve layer. When the gill flaps would open to let the water out, the valve layer would stop the water from rushing in. And then Quinn would loosen the valve muscles and push out the water with water magic. He would have the initiative as the valve openings were small enough to give Quinn the advantage and eject the water like jet streams, opposing the back-flowing water at the same time. This was all theory, and now came the time to see if the system would work in real-life conditions. The batch of water went through the gills, and, as it moved on for ejection, Quinn opened the gill flap. Immediately, he felt the water from outside trying to rush in, but in times of need, Quinn's new valve cover held strong against the water. That observation and success brought a smile to Quinn's face as he confidently moved on to the next stage, which was loosening the valves for ejection. Quinn readied his water magic and covered the water inside with his magic while simultaneously slowly loosening the new gill valves. When the valves opened up, Quinn commanded the water to shoot out and it obeyed and went out, flowing against the water flow outside. Inside Quinn's body, the water had formed a blob with Quinn's water magic in control of every droplet. As the water went out, it acted as a seal that didn't let water inside, emptying out Quinn's reconstructed lung cavity for the next batch of fresh water. The process was successful, and the blood had fresh oxygen circulating around Quinn's body. Quinn, who felt the success, raised both his hands on instinct above and kicked his legs. Immediately, he lost his balance, which made him tumble and rotate inside the vortex. Shit! screamed Quinn as he triggered the safety insignia for the second time and disappeared away. In the stone chamber, Quinn had a big smile on his face. He was happy even though he had to deploy his safety measure. I definitely need more practice on the valve system to make sure that I can do it more easily, smiled Quinn and laughed as he joked. I'm coming for you, Aquaman. One day, I will rule Atlantis. Wait, is Atlantis a city here? Oh, another thing I have to check out. Goody. Quinn West had found a way to safely breathe in turbulent water, which was a first step in his exploration of the third vault. Quinn West, MC Aquaman, cool rebooted version, in making. Web novel has been shadow banning comments recently. This means that any comment that contains profanities in any form will be automatically deleted. So if you are commenting with curses and profanities, censor a single letter or get creative. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis.